But we must not allow the visibility of a few to diminish the efforts to satisfy what is our real responsibility to the still unseen millions who are faced with that basic problem of being black in a white society. So our objective must be to assure that all Americans play by the same rules and all Americans play against the same odds. Who among us would claim that this is a true today? I feel this is the first work of any society which aspires to greatness. So let's get on with it. We know there is injustice. We know there is intolerance. We know there is discrimination and hate and suspicion. And we know there is division among us. But there is a larger truth. We have proved that great progress is possible. We know how much still remains to be done. And if our efforts continue, and if our will is strong, and if our hearts are right, and if courage remains our constant companion, then my fellow Americans, I am confident we shall overcome. What a powerful charge. Using a message drawn from LBJ's last public address, our past presidents call us to action with clarity and optimism. Our deep thanks go out to President Jimmy Carter, President Bill Clinton, President George W. Bush, and President Barack Obama. I'm Angela Evans. Dean of the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. Welcome to our second LBJ 50th Anniversary Forum, Defining a New Destiny. America's history is marked by the fusion of pioneer spirit, pushing beyond boundaries, exploring frontiers, and steadfast willingness, even eagerness, to face our failures and fix them. To embrace worthy disruption is our destiny. To adapt to the scale of disruption today and doing so in ways that mend our division is our challenge. In tonight's forum, we explore innovative ideas and new leadership models emerging from the crises we face today. We have an extraordinary program. Pat Mitchell leads us off with a conversation with Melinda Gates. Then we will hear from J.P. Morgan Chase CEO, Jamie Dimon on building paths to financial opportunity for all people. Lonnie Bunch, the secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, will share insights on why embracing history is critical to building strong societies. XPRIZE Foundation CEO, Anusha Ansare, the first Iranian woman in space, will tell us about exciting innovations to create a safer, more sustainable planet. We'll hear from U.S. Senator Ben Sass from the great state of Nebraska, who taught at the LBJ School. James Milliken, Chancellor of the University of Texas System, talks with Pulitzer Prize winning author Lawrence Wright about how universities can reimagine the future. Next, Admiral William McRaven will share insights on how to lead in times of crisis. And we will welcome Stacey Abrams, an LBJ School alum whose commitment to securing and advancing voting rights has propelled her from Georgia politics to the national stage. Stacy will be in conversation with former Democratic presidential candidate, Pete Buttigieg. I want to thank the sponsors and donors who made this LBJ forum possible. President Johnson's extraordinary daughters, Linda Johnson Robb and Lucy Baines Johnson, BP, Ascension Seton, Exxon Mobil, the J.B. Fuqua Foundation, D.D. Rose in honor of Tom Johnson, Paul and Ada Kinscherf, the Knight Foundation, and the Wasserman Foundation. And now I am honored to bring you a conversation with one of the world's most transformative philanthropists, Melinda Gates, whose work at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Pivotal Ventures her investment company is focused on global health, education, and empowering women and families. 
Melinda's work is more important than ever in this year of global crises. Leading the conversation with Melinda is a pioneering global impact maker, Pat Mitchell, chair of the Sundance Institute and executive director of TED Women. Welcome Melinda and Pat. Good evening, everyone. It's such a great privilege to be a part of the LBJ 50th Anniversary Forums and to have this opportunity to have a conversation with a woman whose leadership defines and adds dimension to the title of these forums, Genius for Good. Please welcome Melinda Gates. Hi, Melinda. Hi, Pat. Thanks for having me. I was just wondering, how does it feel to be introduced as a genius for good? Well, I had never heard that term before. I had to scratch my head and go, okay, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think you say, okay, and thank you, because you, in fact, uh, do add dimension to that, just on the basis of what you've done for so many people in the world, Melinda. And I want to come to that, but I want to start with you, because I just reread your inspiring memoir, The Moment of Lift. Yeah. And I recall that you described that moment when all the barriers are overcome to realizing our dreams and desires and potential, and we quite literally take off. So mm -hmm. what was that moment of lift for you? You know, I think in high school, I had a teacher, my math teacher, who told us girls, I went to an all girls Catholic high school that we could be good in math. And she demonstrated it to us. She supported us. I actually knew I was good in math. But then she brought computers into the school and unbeknownst to me, she had to advocate for them to the head principal, a nun. But as soon as she brought those computers in the school, she got a group of us girls together, asked us if we wanted to learn to program. We said, sure. And she just taught us that we could learn anything. And in fact, she let us get out in front of her in programming. And it was just such a powerful lesson about the difference that one person makes in a small group of other people's lives. And you have made that difference by choosing global philanthropy as the platform for change for good, providing that moment of lift for millions of people around the world and notably women and girls. And yet in this time of a global pandemic, which has disproportionately and adversely impacted women and at a time when women are facing real challenges mm -hmm. for economic opportunity and equity and for women of color, of course, the challenges daily of racial injustice. How do you prioritize now in such a time your philanthropic choices? Well, I think we have to make sure that people realize that these women's issues are the issue, the front and center issue. I think for too long, the world has seen gender issues as the nice to do, the side issue. And no, they're central and they're coming up. This pandemic has exposed during this time the gaps and the inequities we have in society, one of them being racism and another one being the unpaid work that women do. Our economy is built on the backs of women's unpaid labor. Women do two and a half times more unpaid work than men. That's often caring for the young, caring for the elderly during this time, getting groceries and prescriptions to the elderly, trying to school your kids. And it's having a profound effect on women's ability to stay in the workforce. In fact, women are dropping out in droves. And so we have to, during this time, use all of our voices, whether it's from the news media, whether it's civil society, whether it's government, whether it's me as a philanthropist to say, no, we have to focus on these women's issues if we're going to build back from this pandemic and build back better than we've been. And yet when there are so many threats and there is this long overdue racial reckoning as well, there are those who are suggesting that, um, that if we want to be a force for good, we really need to deprioritize women's leadership. And yet in this time, you made this $1 billion commitment to gender equality, putting it front and center. How concerned are you about an economic recession now being led by women, as you suggest, as they have to leave the workforce and the pushbacks 
on some of the hard earned rights and freedoms? How do you keep gender equality at the forefront? We all use our voices and we point to the data that suggests when you have a woman or a person of color with a seat at the table, he or she make different decisions. When they participate in those decisions, we are better as a society. We know it from the private sector. They see it now in their products. Their products sell better when it has a different point of view. So you have to put them at seat at the table. And we now have data that actually suggests that. We can also use the pandemic to point out which countries are doing the best with their pandemic. And no surprise, some of them are headed by female leaders or enlightened male leaders. One of them, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, her country yet again is reopening New Zealand because of her response to the pandemic. That's why you need a female in leadership powers. They make different decisions on behalf of all of society and they make different policy recommendations. They move money differently. And it's just time to have society righted um, in terms of all of these issues because then we'll take care of everybody, not just a segment of our population. It's so good to hear you say this and to hear others from all the sectors you mentioned where there is really good data about the positive outcome of more inclusive teams. But when you look at what we need to have in this world now for a just, sustainable and equitable recovery and to build back better, as you say, we have to recognize the importance of women's leadership roles and you, more than many other voices, Melinda, keep putting that forward. What learnings, again, beyond the data have you observed around the world and the way women lead that does lead to these positive differences? Women lead usually in coalitions. They look at everybody else. They lead well in teams. They're willing to listen and take disparate points of view at the table from people who don't look like them or sound like them. Um, I see it from the most grassroots level. Let's say I'm traveling to a small remote place in India. I see this power in the collective of women. When they come together, they support one another. They name what's real for them and their kids. They talk about maybe the domestic violence or abuse in the village. But then there's a power that they have together that they can stand up and demand their rights from the chief elder, the men in the village, the government. I see it at that level, and I see it all the way at the corporate board level. When you sit in a boardroom that has not one woman with a seat at the table, but multiple women with seats at the table, two or three, they start demanding the right thing for shareholders and for investors. And they say, you know, these policies we've got, they're not quite right. We need to look at these other issues. You see it in Congress. You see the way women hold our military to task on abuse inside the military. That is a woman's perspective. And that's why we need women of all races with seats at the table. As you suggest, there's lots of data and research and real-time evidence, especially happening now around the world to see the way women are leading in crisis, mm -hmm. but how the leadership matters in all times. The LBJ School, as you know, Melinda, has recently launched a women's campaign school, and it's a nonpartisan effort to prepare the female students for becoming power players in the political circles. And in this country, we have more people, more women running for office than ever in our history. Uh, and at Pivotal Ventures, you're encouraging women to take this pathway to political leadership Share with us some of the initiatives that are underway that are leading women forward to, to power and leadership in politics. Well, like the LBJ School, I see the difference that it makes when you have women in leadership roles. So whether that's on the city council, that's the mayor, that's in the state capital, that's at the federal level, it makes a difference. So I'm putting money behind organizations that are helping encourage women at all stages of their career to run for office. We know women can win, but not enough women run. And so going and saying to women, you're ready, you're ready for this next opportunity, this career opportunity, mentoring them, sponsoring them. 
I worked with the Ascend Fund, for instance, who funds many different nonprofit organizations that bring women in a nonpartisan way into politics and show them and help them see that they are ready to run for these offices. I also put money behind places that are collecting data about women in politics so we can funnel that back in and, and show people specifically these are places where we've made different policy decisions because women have a seat at the table. And I think if we do some of those things and what the LBJ school is doing, what others are doing, you will start to see more women running for office, being able to gather resources. It takes money to run for these offices and winning and being successful in those roles. And getting past some of the stereotypes that have kept women from achieving the political wins and leadership that, um, that we do see the differences they make when one's there. I want to switch just for a moment, Melinda, to a bigger global picture that the Gates Foundation gives to the world every year in its goalkeepers mm. report. It's an assessment of the global threats that we're facing. And goodness knows, we certainly have lots of them at the moment, increasing economic inequity, racial inequity, food insecurity, climate emergency. The report was described by the New York Times as grim. And it is grim. What it put forward, though, is the idea that the U.S. is stepping a bit away and back from its role on dealing with the impact and intersectionality of all these issues. Um, and yet you remain sort of an optimistic voice uh, in all that. How do you see how we return this country to being a world leader in competence and generosity? I think we step back into these global institutions and we say, you know, we're here to help lead. We are a partner. We're not the only one leading. Uh, I think we're going to have to go in with some humility and some uh, realization that we got a lot of things wrong during this pandemic, but we also need to come in with resources. We are the wealthiest country in the world. And so one of the global partnerships that's been set up, for instance, to get vaccines and therapeutics and tests out to the rest of the world, the U.S. needs to not only be in that, but needs to provide some funding, just like the European nations and other high and middle income countries are putting funding in so that we get vaccines and therapeutics for everybody, not just certain countries. And, it, and quite frankly, it's the only way we're going to get the global economy up and running. We are interconnected. Our supply chains are dependent on these different countries. So the U.S. needs to come in with some humble pie um, and some resources and realize that it's just one actor on this global stage. But I think, I think the American people expect that, quite frankly, of our leadership. I don't think we have necessarily been getting that. Um, what I see in the everyday acts of kindness right now going on in the world keeps me encouraged. I think that's the best of who we are as American citizens and humanity. And I think um, we can step back into those roles. You know, Melinda, you anticipated my next question, which is really when I hear someone with your experience, what you witness around the world, how much grief and suffering you see and the efforts, of course, that are made to relieve it and to lead to recovery. I wonder as a woman, as a woman leader, what keeps you optimistic? What gives you hope? It is, it is these small acts of kindness and it is the next generation. You know, I have three adult children. One is in graduate school, one's in college, one's in high school, but hearing the conversations they are having with their friends and hearing their friends' points of view and really listening to one another and the learning they've been doing as a generation during this time of, you know, protesting in the United States or in pandemic. I mean, this generation, they're flexible, they're resilient, they're learning, they're listening, they want something different. And that makes me encouraged for humanity. And I know that it's actually possible. And, um, they're the most connected generation we've had yet. I think that has some pitfalls, but I think it has some upsides. And I'm encouraged that they'll use that upside for good. We have to ensure that they do, right? Because yes, we do. 
<laughs> we we have left them many problems, and and uh, they know how how challenged the reputation of the U.S. and uh, is at the moment, and they can reclaim many of those values with our help. So um, I'm with you and saying that's where my hope is too. I know also there are many women and men who are with us tonight for this conversation. They wanna be geniuses for good. Everybody wants to be that change for good, right? What, what have you learned? What have you seen in your philanthropy as well as your on the ground experiences around the world? What learnings can you share with us that would help each of us as we set about to provide that moment of lift? for ourselves and others. What I have seen and what I know deeply is that one person, one person can make a profound difference in someone else's life. Whether that's a teacher for a kid in middle school, whether that's a healthcare worker, whether that's putting $50 in a woman's account online so that she can buy new seeds for her farm, we have a profound effect on one another by how we show up in the world and how we act. And when you get a group of collective individuals to come, to come together, it's as Margaret Mead said, never underestimate the group, a group of powerful individuals to change the world. It's the only thing that ever has. We all have individual power, whether that's our time, our money, our energy, our hearts, our minds, when we put those things to their best possible use, use, we can create change individually and as a collective. And I have seen it. I know it. I've seen it all over the world. And we can create the world that we want. And uh, I'm encouraged when I see that. I'm encouraged as well. And as you know, you and I both believe that one big lever we have that we can use uh, as women and our male allies is showing up for each other. Absolutely. And Pat, you have shown up for so many people over so many years. I mean, you were in this work before I was, and you and a generation of female leaders before me cut the path for my generation, and I'm cutting the path for the next generation. That's something we pass on as leaders and that we should do. But you're an inspiration to me too, and to many others. Thank you for that, Melinda. Um, I would love to try something a little bit new and unusual, if you don't mind. Knowing okay. that, uh, based on our mutual respect and admiration for each other, how about a lightning round in which I just throw out some words and you give me quick, instant responses. Would you be willing to do that? Sure. All right. They happen to all start with T. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the first is, is one that I feel so strongly about, and I imagine you do too. What's your response to the word trust? Fundamental. It's fundamental to everything we do. There's a friend of Warren Buffett's who says, we live in a web of undeserved trust. Oh, that's powerful. Mm -hmm. Transparency. Necessary. And it is one of the things that moves societies forward when you have transparency about what's really going on or good data. Um, data is transparency because it shows you what's actually really happening. Mm. Tenacity. I want to use the word fundamental again. <laughs> I, honestly, tenacity is just, it's a, it's a necessity. You got to be tenacious, particularly if you're working on hard societal issues. Warren always said to Bill and me at the beginning of the foundation, look, on your down days, don't get down on yourself when you don't feel like you're making progress. He said, you're working on the issues that society has left behind because they are hard. And so what I would tell anybody working on any societal issue, um, it takes tenacity, even on the hard days. So good. Tenderness. Heart. I just think of, when I think of tenderness, I think of a mother's love for their child. And I have not only experienced it, I've with my own children, but I've seen it uh, with mothers holding their babies all over the globe. 
And it's that tenderness of that bond of that relationship that is the most important thing in life. And it's what allows us to flourish and to be who we're meant to be when you have that tenderness. And lastly, Texas. Lone Star State. <laughs> Home for me. I grew up there, surprisingly. <laughs> so somewhere in the back of my closet, I'm sure I still have a pair of cowboy boots and a cowboy hat, but they're collecting a little dust these days because I can't travel, but uh, Texas is my home. And Texas is the home of the LBGA school and these forums. And actually, I just am sorry we didn't ask you to go into that closet and get the cowboy boots <laughs> and the cowboy hat. <laughs> because I would have loved them as actually my image of you, Melinda, <laughs> is with those big boots walking through the world, <laughs> leaving big footprints, uh, changing the world for good. Thank you for this time, Melinda Gates. Thank you, Pat. So enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, Melinda and Pat, for that thoughtful and insightful conversation. This year of challenges from the COVID-19 pandemic to racial protests and more has heightened our awareness of yawning economic divides. Our next speaker, J.P. Morgan Chase Chairman and CEO, Jamie Dimon, has been a leading voice on the equality gap and this year, he's pressing even harder for new ideas and fresh solutions. He will be interviewed by Sellers Easton Media co-CEO, Patty Sellers. Welcome to the LBJ Forum, Jamie Dimon. Patty, I'm thrilled to be here, thank you. So for those of you who don't know, Jamie Dimon, the chairman and CEO of JP Morgan Chase is one of the more involved <clears throat> Fortune 500 CEOs, much like LBJ himself, wanted leaders to be thinkers and doers who go out in the world and solve global problems. Jamie has used, since he became CEO in January 1st, 2006, he's used his CEO platform to go out in the world and really tackle problems around the world and engage in policy, engage in, in social issues. Jamie, my first question is, when you became CEO 15, almost 16 years ago, um, did, you, did you think of your, using your platform that way? Or were you just like most CEOs who wanted to make next quarter's numbers? Yeah. No, I never, you know, believe it or not, we, I always focus much on customers, employees, you know, community is the one which is a little more complicated, but no, I always thought if you want to build something great, you better do it all right. It's more like a team. You can have really weak spots and think you're going to build a great company. Yeah. So uh, a little over a year ago, when, when the business roundtable came out with its new direction that, um, the corporations are not just accountable to shareholders, they're accountable to customers, employees, suppliers, communities, um, as well as shareholders. And listing shareholders last, you were the chairman of the business roundtable then, you were an architect of that new policy. Um, was that new thinking because of the times we are in? Of course, this was pre-COVID, but how had your thinking on that evolved? Well, actually it was a reporter, Patty, who had mentioned at a dinner we were having with some CEOs that you guys are stuck in this whole thing. And I went and checked the old paradigm and I came to the board of the BRT and said, this is not what we do every day, talk about shoulder value. And I don't know how you could build shoulder value without taking care of customers. And you can't take care of customers without taking care of employees. You have to be, you have to be successful, but this other notion was short-term versus long-term. You know, to me, there's only one term, which is the long-term. You don't, it's like anything most of us do, we, we're always thinking way ahead than like next quarter. In fact, I always tell people whatever happens in a quarter in a company is based on decisions you made over the last 10 years. So the hard part, Patty, was this concept of community. How does community relate? So I'm going to give you two examples. One is when is if you own a corner bakery store, you get involved in the community. That's what we do. You take the ice off the front. You give jobs. You help a local religious institution. But all a big company is is you know we operate in I'd say 2,000 hamlets around the world. I want to be locally respected, just like that person who participated in the community. 
because you make your community better, it's better for everybody. The second, which is more complicated, which relates more to today, is if 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 pe people get very selfish when they come to D.C. and they fight for things, that if if we had a healthier economy for everybody, and the economy is going at three percent and not two percent, that would lift up the poor. That would create jobs. That would create housing. That would create tax revenues. And so I tell people it's a harder thing to do because it's policy. It's not just about your company, but most companies be better off at 3% growth and 2% growth. So I say you better worry about getting the country doing well, because that's probably more important than fighting for some little tax break in Washington, D.C. Do you think that more CEOs should engage in policy the way you do? Yeah, I think that they I think that. If you want to have a successful society, you need collaboration between government and business. The world is complex. It's very fast. It's very technological. We need good government. They cannot do it alone anymore. So if you look at education or infrastructure or, or AI, or all these various things, they're just, they just weren't set up to move that fast. And so, you know, I'm in D.C. right now. If you go to D.C., a lot of them say we need help. So, yeah, I, I think business and by it's more of an evolution. A lot of companies already did it a good way and they're doubling down on it. But I, I do think it's, it became too easy for successful institutions. I mean, successful institutions. They could be businesses. They could be universities to drive by literally and figuratively the worst parts of society mm -hmm. because you can just skip it. But if you skip it, then you've made society worse. And that's my, you know, why I think, you know, we all need to get involved to make society a better place. Tell me about, tell us about the uh, New York Jobs Council. Yeah. Well, it's a very specific part of that, which is, you know, in New York City, uh, there's, ama there's an amazing number. 500,000 kids go to community college, community, uh, community university, C-U-N-Y or C-C-N-Y, and, and we've, we need to get them jobs when they get out. So it's something like a, a big percent don't graduate at all. So they spend some money on it and then you get the benefit. So the notion was that the CEOs make a long-term sustained, dedicated effort directed at creating jobs for kids when they get out of high school, community college, et cetera. Because, and, and we need well-trained kids, but it also can lift up that part of society. And people think that society is a zero-sum game. It's not. I'll give you one quick example. If Canada was a failed country, America would be far worse off. Right. We'd have a, a not good trading partner. We'd have to have mil military in the border. We don't have any of that. So if you can lift up the South Bronx, parts of Brooklyn, we all will be better off. And it's the moral thing to do. And it's better social outcomes. So I think we got to, and, and to me, COVID and the murder of George Floyd just pointed out what we already knew. Yeah. And so let's just get at it and start fixing some of this stuff. And a healthy New York is better for J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, just a little bit of background. I'd love to give you a little bit of background for those of you who are interested in this. This New York Jobs Council, CEO Council, is a really good example of the kind of thing that Jamie is talking about. Google, IBM, Verizon, McKinsey, Microsoft, CUNY, which is the largest urban university system in the U.S., in fact, the New York Department of Education, nonprofits, and community leaders all came together. Whose idea was this, Jamie? Well, actually, it really actually goes to my wife, to tell you the truth, who started doing apprenticeship programs. A lot of these people got together on to, to start these apprenticeships. And when I got involved a little bit, I said, you know, if you want, if we want to accelerate this, and make it permanent, big time and important. Let all the CEOs, most of them who, who know it's a problem and all the CEOs sign up right away. Let's get together, let's organize it, let's put some money behind it. And also by the way, Civic Society was there to help. Like the, the guy who runs uh, CUNY uh, is just fabulous. So when you get people lined up together, you know what, it will work. It's still gonna be a lot of work to get it done, but it will work. And the basic idea here, here is to help connect untapped talent with in-demand jobs and train them properly. And I know that you have just announced um, some a new program in Texas, uh, similar in terms of training people for the jobs that exist and um, uh, enable Texas to, 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 to fill 
build jobs. Uh, explain that to us, if you would. Yeah, so part of this, so a lot of jobs are national. So like automotive, taking care of auto automobiles, probably coding, certain retail, hospitality, certain are very local. You know, so if you, and, and so this got to, it really needs to be a local effort with local businesses. So, you know, I don't know the specific ones we're doing in Dallas, we, in Dallas or Texas. We have 25,000 employees there. So I think what we're going to be doing is coding, uh, uh, digital services and things like that. But and as you know, in Austin, where you're based, that's becoming a huge thing in Austin, too. So it's got to be very focused. That, but the New York City Job CO Council, part is the local focus. Uh -huh. and, and we we think that's what works when you get local companies and they're in. They'll say, you know what, I could take three apprenticeships. And so by that, the other thing about the New York City CEO thing, it's not going just for the 30. It's going to be opened up to everybody equally to participate, to add and to benefit. So hopefully the whole community can get involved one day. That's great. That's great. And, you know, Jamie, I just uh, for those of you who have not seen 60 Minutes have, has done a couple of terrific pieces on, on Jamie and the work at at uh, J.P. Morgan Chase in terms of building communities. And I went back and I watched uh, the piece that Leslie Stahl did did with you. One thing that you did, you cold called Mike Duggan the mayor of Detroit, who you had never yeah. met and said, I want to help Detroit. Yeah. I'm making this point because when you get to be a person in your position, sometimes I think there's a view that you're not making the calls yourself. I bet you made, I bet you made a lot of the calls to get those CEOs on the New York Jobs CEO Council mm -hmm. and you instigated the work in Detroit. Um, yeah. What's the lesson in terms of building programs like this and kind of leadership from the top. Yeah, so I called every one of those CEOs directly mm -hmm. and probably more than once. <laughs> and Mayor Doug, we were, we were one of the larger banks in Detroit. And, and obviously Detroit has suffered more than any other city in America pretty much and had no renaissance like a lot of other cities did. And then this guy was out there, he's a white guy elected in a black town, 80, 75% black. And he just, you know what he said? Anyone who could help me, I want to help my town with police, with hospitals, with schools, with jobs, with infrastructure. And I was like all in. So I called him and said, hey, we're all in. So we made a 200 million seven year devoted effort. He's become like a friend of the family. He's a he's a, just an exceptional guy. We reached out to unions. We reached out to a whole bunch of the people. And so, I mean, the lesson, roll up your sleeves, get involved. So I've been up to Detroit on this program, I don't know, five, six or seven times or something like that. We, but we've had probably 50, 60 people working there almost nonstop since we started. So it wasn't, once we got, you know, it wasn't just the rah-rah, then we got deep, deep. Whoever will work with us, it could be the schools, there are a bunch of charities there, affordable housing, a community development institutions to do affordable housing. Uh, you know, we went to places to train kids and machine, there they need a lot of machine tooling and it's really robotics. And actually, if you go there, a lot of us have a hard time learning that too. It takes a while. You know, but that's what the, and by all of a sudden it starts to work because Fiat and I think someone else are building a brand new plant there, 10,000 new people directly, another 20 or 30,000 indirectly. That one thing can take the unemployment down by multiple points, that one thing. And, and by the way, if the kids weren't trained in the jobs, they probably wouldn't have wanted to go near Detroit. Um, a lot of your work with cities, whether it's New York, Detroit, uh, what you're going to be doing in Texas involves um, giving people training that doesn't necessarily re require college degrees or graduate right. degrees. Nothing against the LBJ school, right, Jamie? Right. That's the yeah. LBJ school is, is fantastic. But um, a lot of it is basically applying data and AI and all sorts of technology yeah. To match jobs and education and yeah. job needs and education. Am I right? You're, you're totally right. So one of the lessons, a lot of our companies had this, you know, college degree required and we're getting rid of that where it's not required. A lot of people are great out of high schools. They're devoted. They, they want the job. And so, and all the jobs, as you all go through your lives, it's just, you, you build these skills, you know, and so cer certifications will matter, but it's lifelong learning. And so this notion that you're going to have one job and, you know, that's going to be it. No, you have to like kind of continuously learn and stuff like that. So there's a school, I mean, it's an amazing thing. There's a school in New York City called 
uh, Aviation High School. It's a high school. Kids travel from all over to go there for the following reason, mostly minorities, and their parents want them to go. They go to high school, they learn to lead, read, write, arithmetic. They also learn how to maintain small aircraft, hydraulics, electrical systems, et cetera. And 95% get out with the job at $60,000 a year. So a very specific skill mm -hmm. as part of high school, but they leave with a great livelihood. And of course, from there, they can go on to college if they want. They're not, no one's being restricted. So this notion that it's only one thing, that will have to change over time. And then there are other things, which I know you know about, you know, giving, you know, felons who deserve a second chance, give them a second chance. You know, we can't have people pay their price. So one of the things we're doing now, and I think we've hired several thousand this year, because they paid their price. You know, they were, these are not, you know, highly violent folks. These are people who, you know, did the wrong thing at one point in life and give them a chance to get their life back. And so there are, there are tons of programs and you can go around the country. And part of what we're trying to do is our efforts, you know, have a force multiplier. If it works here, do it there. How has COVID um, accelerated or changed this kind of work that you're doing? You know, it was COVID less so than George Floyd. You know, the murder of George Floyd was a sea change, I think, in the attitude of Americans and people about the injustice that's taken place here, uh, the unfair. I mean, it created far more empathy for, you know, for a class of people, our black brethren citizens, about, you know, there's been a long time that we've been talking about getting the, the parity economically and all, all these other measures and stuff like that. But I, I guess my frustration with COVID and George Floyd is it pointed out things we already knew. We have failed as a nation to do all, the, and you're a public policy school. So we're not, we, we're no longer good at public policy. Infrastructure is not good. And inner city school education is not good. You know, uh, we have red tape and regulation that crippled us, the uh, small businesses. We've never designed proper health care, which is far more cost efficient and covers more people we have today. And so all these things are fixable. Immigration, we don't have a proper immigration policy. And in each one of those things is hurting America. It's hurting American citizens. Often the people that hurt the most are the lower income and minorities. And so we need really good public policy. And one of the lessons to me for a lot of the folks listening here and the younger folks, public policy takes analysis, detail, understanding, understand the real world. Then you got to work the politics of it. But somehow, you know, we've, we've made our incompetencies become a little bit of a joke around the world. And, you know, people see it right when they fly into our airport sometimes that we can't keep up. And so to me, this is this is the single most important thing that America's got to do in the next 20 years. Get back to rational public policy. Of course, you have differences with Democrats, and Republicans. But that doesn't mean we can't have safer roads, better airports, better bridges, better function inner city schools and a health care system that covers more people and cheaper. So, Jamie, you're sitting there in Washington during this interview. What is, if you could work your magic on Capitol Hill or in Washington, D.C., can you name a couple of things that you would you would want to do? I'd have a massive infrastructure bill. And, you know, infrastructure, you know, it, it needs to be like a trillion dollars, by the way. But that's if done right. So, you know, sometimes you hear people say infrastructure for jobs. No, you're not doing infrastructure to create jobs. You're doing infrastructure, you can need good roads and good hospitals and good, you know, ports and good canals and good uh, airports and all these various things. It will create great jobs. It will also drive growth for years. Inner city school education, we've already spoken about, but there are a lot of things to do there. Uh, I think healthcare. I, you really got to get a group of really smart people. Some of you kids may solve it one day to, to go off and solve it. And uh, regulations, you know, it's not, obviously companies need to be regulated, but think of but any one of you, go go take literally, you want to have fun? Go take 10 small business or smaller companies out for lunch and ask them what it's like because they have to file OSHA forms and workers' comp forms. They get audited by the city, the state, the federal government, and they own two stores that sell pots and pans. You know, And so we're, we're, we're crippling our own society with some of these things. And immigration, we've already had in America, Schumer McCain had a bill, DACA stays a path to citizenship, a long path for tax paying, law abiding, but undocumented Americans, like literally could take 15 years, uh, and more merit based uh, immigration, which was one of the great things for our country. And if you look at growth, 
0.3% more growth in immigration, 0.3% more growth a year from infrastructure. God knows how much more growth you get if we lifted up better parts of our society and education properly. So that would be my wish. And when I come down, you can imagine that that's, I'm always talking about that, writing about it. And it always gets bogged down in this partisan stuff, but I don't care about the partisan stuff. I care about lifting up America and its citizens. And I also remind people, because you're a public policy school, America is still the arsenal of democracy. Our, our military strength is predicated upon our economic strength. And, and so we, we got to get this right. And by the way, we have a great hand. It's not like we're going to lose in the next 20 years, but let's just get it right to lift up our people and do better. What keeps you from running for public office? Well, you know, my health hasn't been unbelievably great. I, I just, you know, I've been in business my whole life. And I think when business people go out there and you think you'd be good at politics, I think there's a common set of stuff. So I think leadership has common things and administration, and but it's not 100% common. I think a lot of politicians are good at what they do, but you've got to get out there. I call it retail politicking. I've never done retail politicking. And, you know, stand in those town halls and take, I do them for my company. I'll take any and all questions, but I think it's a skill. And, you know, the, the notion that a business person automatically has a skill, I think if you're going to do it, you should start, you know, you shouldn't go for president. I mean, we do have a president who did it, shockingly, you know, who went from business to president, but that's, that's never happened before. And, you know, so most people, you know, they're congressmen, the senator, they're, they're in their government or governors, and then they, you know, they get real political experience and they run. So uh, if I was going to do it, I probably would have had to start 10 years ago. So, Jamie, besides what you said about um, about encouraging young people to figure out answers to our health, America's health care problems, et cetera, what other parting words do you have to emerging leaders who may be going to the LBJ school, maybe they're graduates, maybe they're in some other uh, field, but they may be in business, they may be in government, they may be yeah. in the nonprofit world. How can they best think about navigating a path where yeah. they can make a difference? Yeah, so first of all, learning is lifelong, meaning learn, 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 learn. You're going to learn by reading and by other people. S second is in business, in public policy, Facts, analysis, detail, facts, analysis, detail, repeat, repeat over. People do a terrible job at that. And they also go into facts, analysis, deal with the preconceptions. Throw out the preconceptions you get in the room. Uh, talk to everybody. So if you're a Democrat, read George Will, read Holman Jenkins, read, really read uh, uh, Hayek. Don't, don't assume. They're, these are really smart people, and they're not unethical and moral in any way. And if you're a Republican, read Tom Friedman or you know, or, or David Brooks or something like that, because you learn a lot when you sit at the table and you talk to other people, where they're coming from, why they're there. You know, you could have a little empathy in life. And the third thing is kind of more amorphous about leadership. And I'm going to call it humanity and humility, which is you don't know everything. No one wants to work for a jerk. Uh, people who point fingers, whip, kick people when they're down. You know, that's not, you're not going to run a great institution that way. You see it all the time finger point and second guessing. I know LBJ loved Teddy Roosevelt's thing. The credit goes to the person bloodied in the field, you know, in the arena, not the critic in the stand. And so have humility that, that these, these are tough things people are trying to get done. Respect other people. Uh, and believe me, you will have, if, if you treat people properly, you'll have followers who respect that leader. And leaders have to earn the respect every day. It isn't like somehow you get to this vaunted position and then and then you're entitled to whatever you think no you better earn it every day too people want to see you that you actually do what you say say what you do um and you know lead with your heart a little bit you have teddy roosevelt's in the arena quote frame somewhere don't you i do and i sent it to uh hank paulson when he was secretary of treasury you know going through all that terrible stuff you know through tarp and all of that i sent it to him he appreciated it and then your friend Andrew Ross Sorkin made it at the beginning of his book. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jamie, you're inspiring. There should be more Fortune 500 CEOs like you, and we will hope for that for the future. So thank you, Jamie Dimon, for Patty. being with us today. Patty, thank you very much. A, a great pleasure. You're too kind. And folks, I wish you all the best in all your future endeavors. 
JP Morgan Chase chairman and CEO Jamie Dimon just told us that the murder of George Floyd marked a sea change for America. Since our conversation, he and the bank stepped up very big to address issues around race. JP Morgan Chase pledged $30 billion over the next five years to advance racial equity. Uh, this is Governor Greg Abbott. Congratulations to the LBJ School of Public Affairs on 50 years of academic excellence and inspiring future generations to pursue careers in public service. Texas is at the forefront of producing bold and innovative thinkers, thinkers who will help us face the complex global challenges of both today as well as tomorrow. As an international economic power, there is no better environment to develop the next generation of leaders than right here at the LBJ School. Thank you all for your commitment to supporting future leaders and inspiring them to pursue a career in the important area of public service. I also want to recognize the LBJ Board of Trustees, Dean Evans, and the professors and staff and the students who continue to champion President Johnson's legacy of extraordinary vision for this incredible school. So congratulations once again on this tremendous milestone and may the next 50 years be even more exceptional. May God continue to bless you in your efforts and may God continue to forever bless the great state of Texas. 15 years ago, Lonnie Bunch III had one staff member and no funding for a museum he was tasked with building, the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. He relentlessly pursued his vision to create a place that would make America better. The Washington DC based museum opened four years ago and has been jam packed from the start with more than 6 million visitors to date. Last year, Lonnie Bunch was appointed the 14th Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, and he oversees 19 museums. Interviewing Secretary Bunch is award-winning documentarian, journalist, and CEO, Soledad O'Brien. Welcome, Soledad and Secretary Bunch. Secretary Bunch, welcome. What an honor and a pleasure for me to have an opportunity to chat with you on a great occasion, the 50th anniversary of the school. Thanks for being with me. Well, I'm so pleased and I'll be with you as long as you call me Lonnie. <laughs> it's a deal, it's a deal. So, so let's begin by going backwards. 50 years ago, describe for me the atmosphere of the country. We'll talk a little bit about LBJ himself in a moment, but what was happening in the country? How were people feeling and what were the sort of main topics that people were wrestling with? Well, 50 years ago, there was a concern that the country was in disarray, um, that there were so many issues that were tugging at the soul of the country. So you have so many people concerned about the war in Vietnam. So there's a lot of pressure, a lot of angst, a lot of demonstrations. But then you also have moments like the killing of the students at Kent State and at Jackson State, which really made people feel that young America was under attack. Um, clearly, what you also have going on is the civil rights issues and the racial issues. You've got unrest in the cities. Um, even in 1970, smaller towns like Asbury Park, New Jersey, has an insurrection, a riot. And so what you really are seeing are concerns about the future of the country, um, overwhelmingly concerned about international issues, and there is a great push and divide over whether or not protests are right or whether they really are something that needs to be countered by a law and order position. Hmm. Lots of overlap with 2020, it sounds like. It does seem um, to me very similar. Well, were people uh, anxious? I mean, how would you describe the populace anxious? And, and how was the economy? Were people feeling good about the economic direction the country was going in? Well, on the one hand, there were several things that gave people hope. Um, you know, 1969, we made it to the moon. People were still on a sort of high based on that. Um, you also had um, the continuing of the prosperity that occurred during most of the 60s 
but it's beginning to sort of turn down. So while people are feeling good, there's angst. They're worried that the economy as well as international issues are going to bring the country down. And so I think that uh, what you really have is a tipping point where people think something has to change. Um, and the worry is either for the good or for ill. Mm. So that's the environment in which LBJ now is um, helping create this school. Well, tell me a little bit about how the public saw him specifically and how he saw his legacy of his time in the White House and what he thought his future might be uh, on his way out. Well, I think what's clear is that in 1964, um, LBJ has such support. Um, and yet by the time he leaves office, um, people are very critical of him. All the things that he did domestically were overshadowed by the international, by Vietnam. Um, and so what you see is people not realizing the importance of the work that he's done domestically. And what people are saying is he disrupted the country because of the war, the economy is starting to tank. In essence, there was a belief that LBJ hurt more than he helped. And I think that for LBJ himself, the great concern was to realize that he knew how important his domestic agenda was, and he hoped that would be his legacy. Um, but clearly, Vietnam challenged that legacy. It seems now, from a 2020 perspective, that that domestic legacy was able to break through and all the value of some of the things that he accomplished domestically became not just critically important, but teed up so many other things that followed. So let's talk about that domestic legacy and when it became clear that those were so important for the direction the United States would take. What, what would you say is a defining uh, piece of legacy that we should be talking about here? Well, I think the notion of a great society, of Lyndon Johnson saying that America can be a nation that can live up to its ideals, that can be fair, that can provide economic opportunity for all. And when you look at what he accomplished domestically, very few presidents throughout American history have been able to do that, whether it's the work in civil rights. I mean, let's be honest. The first time there was even a real attempt to do any civil rights legislation was when Johnson was in the Senate and he and he championed the 1957 and 1960 um, legislation. But these were modest in scope. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was transformative. It really said that de facto segregation was not acceptable and that African-Americans had certain rights. The Voting Rights Act ensured that there would be um, opportunities for African-Americans and others to have a voice in this government. Uh, fair housing actions that he did were crucially important, but also beyond race. I mean, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, his immigration reform that really allowed a fairer system to allow immigrants to enter into this country. In some ways, what I think is so powerful is that Lyndon Johnson had an important legacy. And that legacy is that a country can be made better when government interaction works with the sort of sense of the public. Um, and I think in many ways, I can't think of anybody who had as big a domestic impact as Lyndon Baines Johnson. Um, on the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act back in 2014, President Obama said this, because of laws President Johnson signed, new doors of opportunity and education swung open for everybody. Not all at once, but they swung open. And he kind of ended that comment by talking about how they swung open for him as well, which led ultimately to him becoming president of the United States. Uh, when we think though about a lot of those things that you ticked off, um, those are things we're still not just talking about, but debating and legislatively are um, trying to undermine. What's happening in the country today that sort of all that other legislation has led to? Well, I think first of all, um, let's be clear, that legislation led to a different America an America that was fairer and freer. Um, no one can deny that. Um, I think what the challenge is, is that there was a sense that the federal government was too active, too involved in changing and wanted to sort of see it uh, a more hands off. Um, and so you have this debate between what is the role of government um, in the economy, in the social and political sphere. And I think that Johnson had one poll, 
kind of progressive government. And there are others who feel that the government should be laissez-faire, more hands off. And I think that's the big debate that you see today. And then I think the challenge is also whether or not there's a belief that the ills of the 1950s and 60s have been taken care of. Do we still need the legislation to protect issues of race or issues of gender? And I think those are debates you see today. Um, and they are really at the heart of what I would argue is a struggle for the soul of America. You've said this, we understand we are trapped in history only if we fail to learn from it. Tell me about the history that we have failed to learn from and maybe more positively, some of the history that we have learned from and, and figured out as a society. What we've learned in a positive way is that when people cross racial and political lines, um, that they can change a country, that they can help um, address ills that people never thought could be addressed. Candidly, people felt that segregation would always be part of American way of life, legal segregation. Um, and that was changed because people came together. Um, I think the downside is that what you see is where people are sort of no longer able to have clear conversations and debates. That in essence, people are saying there's no middle ground. Um, and in some ways, the challenge of today, candidly, is to recognize the power of a positive government in people's lives is really what people are looking for. And the debate is, how active should that government be? One of my favorite lines in your bio, it's insane, so I'm going to read it to everybody, and I know people already know this, but it goes like this. Uh, Bunch was the director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. When he started as director in 2005, he had one staff member, no collections, no funding, and no site for a museum. <laughs> so talk to me about those early days. Um, what was the vision like? What was your idea of what a museum, much like a school, school, I think, right? There has to be a vision of like what the mission of this entity is. How did you see it? Well, you know, when you, we called it the museum of no, right? When we started, <laughs> um, but we had a vision and the vision was that history matters, that understanding who we once were can help us better understand who we are today and could point us towards a better future. And the vision was really simple. It was that on the one hand, America needed to confront its tortured racial past. It needed to remember. So we wanted to give America the opportunity to remember the good and the bad, the, the amazing achievement and the amazing tragedies. We also recognized that what we had was an opportunity to craft a museum that said, this is not a story about Black America for Black America. That in essence, African-American history in some ways is the quintessential American story. It's a story that helps us understand the promise of America and that we wanted everybody to realize that regardless of who they are, regardless of how long their family has been in this country, regardless of racial issues, they've been shaped by this story. So that dual vision of saying the Smithsonian is a place that uh, people will come to grapple with issues that they didn't in the past, they will remember, and then to recognize that this is a story that was for us all was what motivated us to move forward, to start from no, to ultimately get to, my God, what an opening in 2016. And honestly, I mean, pre-coronavirus, uh, I thought it was amazing to see giant lines, which sometimes was a bummer if you were hoping to get in that day, <laughs> but also very diverse lines. You know, this idea that that every person, tourists and Americans and white people and black people and Asian people and Latino, I mean, I, I think it was just such a, a hugely popular place for people to learn about American history. How did LBJ feel about his legacy looking backward? And then what did he want to accomplish in his, in his later days once he moved out of the White House? I think that LBJ struggled with the notion of his legacy being colored solely by Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that what he really wanted people to see was the domestic legacy that he was able to, to build compromises, coalitions, things that people had not done effect, effectively in the past were done in a way that allowed LBJ to sort of craft legislation 
that protected so many aspects of American life, whether it's wilderness or environmental issues or child care issues. So in a way, I think that he struggled to make sure that people didn't just think about Vietnam. The school has been a very interesting vehicle, I think, for that. Stacey Abrams, who was an outstanding alum from the school, used to talk about, um, I'm going to paraphrase her so badly, but basically that you weren't, a, the, the, the mission and the ethos of the school was about acting and doing and accomplishing. It wasn't to sit around and, and, and ponder problems. You had to get out in society and actually do things. How does that fit with who LBJ was? I think that is so powerful. In some ways, the school has really done a major service, which is building on LBJ's legacy to say that you can do good through public service, um, that the political arena um, is a place where um, dreams can be made real, um, a place where real tragedies can be prevented. And so I think in many ways, you see people coming out of the school in an activist bent. It's their job to use the tools they have, the training they've received to make a country better, to make a difference. And I think in a way that was what would be making LBJ smile. Hmm. Talk to me about how challenging a time it's, I mean, 2020, that's an understatement. It's been challenging for everybody on every front. If you're a museum, whose business is in bringing people in mass through the doors. It has to be incredibly different, difficult. And you, of course, oversee all of these museums. What's the strategy now? How are you serving uh, people through museums when they can't actually come in the door? So when they write my legacy, they'll say, oh, he's the guy that closed the Smithsonian. <laughs> um, so that basically what I realized is that this moment meant Buildings may close, but the Smithsonian has to be open. And so we pivoted virtually. Many museums around the world are doing that, are recognizing that um, more people, especially Americans, are more comfortable receiving content digitally than ever before. So let's do that. Let's give them the material they need. But also, we realized that we needed to help people educate their children. As teachers began to no longer teach, as parents became teachers, we realized that we had such amazing educational material from the arts, from science, from history, um, and we wanted the public to use that. So one was, was going virtual. But two, the other was recognizing that we have expertise that can help a country both understand the pandemic of the virus. We have people who could help us understand how viruses transfer from animals to humans and, and the like, but also we have people who can help us think about the challenge of race. Um, and so it was really important for, the, for me and the Smithsonian to say, we're going to be a place that's a value right now. We're going to give you the opportunity to discuss issues that you traditionally don't want to discuss, but you will because it's the Smithsonian. So we really tried to do that. But it also meant that we recognized that we had to think about what does reopening ultimately mean? Because you're ultimately going to reopen these buildings. And so we really had to ask ourselves the question is, what happens in museums that is so special is that you create informal communities. People walk to an artifact or an exhibition and start talking to the people they don't know. Um, and the stories are amazing. So how do you create that informal community when you have to social distance? So we've thought a lot about, you know, how to, how to reduce the number of people who come into the building. So therefore we can social distance so you can still have those conversations. So that in essence, what we've done is said, look, it's a new time, it's a new day, and that we'll never go back to the way things once were. Let's use this to rethink so many things that we've done that maybe we can do better. I'll tell you my one big concern. The big concern is that technology has always been the way that we've made these stories accessible for people who have learning disabilities or like. So now are people gonna to wanna to touch screens? Are people gonna to wanna to do that? So it's really a challenge for us to think about what are the new technologies that will keep people safe and comfortable, but still allow us to be the accessible institutions we wanna be? It, it aligns a lot, I think, with the school because this idea of you have to be relevant in this moment. And this moment is a quite a chaotic moment with some very challenging issues and conversations to have. Is it been hard? I know that you've talked a lot about the, you know, how you keep the, the tradition of the Smithsonian while also getting into some of these conversations that I think freak people out sometimes? 
Well, you know, it would be easy if I just said, let's talk about the panda. Um, and that would make people comfortable. But I think that part of the key for me is, what are the tools that you have as an individual or as an institution to help a country? And so I felt that it was crucially important for us not to sit on our hands and wait this out, but to really say, we can help craft material that teaches kids about COVID-19 and how to handle that. Um, we can actually have conversations in Minneapolis or in St. Louis around issues of race. Um, in essence, we can bring our expertise in science and culture and history and make it accessible to the public so that they can see the Smithsonian as some place they trust, but as some place that can help them get the tools they need to live their lives today. You've said that Americans romanticize history. What do you mean by that? In many ways, Americans are a historical people. They want to look at the myths. They want to celebrate those myths. And what my argument is that myths are crucially important, but myths aren't real history. Um, when you look at things like the Confederate monuments, the conversation around um, why those monuments were even created, or they had less to do with the Civil War and more to do with sort of white supremacy. So part of what for me is, I think history is just the most amazing tool, this most exciting thing you can understand and I want people to have that excitement, to grapple with the past in ways that are meaningful, that allow us to live our lives today. I want people to recognize that history gives us the best inspiration um, and challenges us to live up to our stated ideals, but it also gives us tools to understand what can happen when people come together and what can happen when they don't. In your mind, and our final question, what do you think was LBJ's most important and enduring legacy. And it doesn't have to be an individual piece of legislation. It can be a mindset, it can be a, a, a philosophy. For you personally, what is the thing that you take away from, from what he was able to do and sometimes struggle to do in this country? What LBJ did for me, looking back, is it made me realize that change is possible, um, that there were intractable issues, immigration issues, environmental issues. Um, Johnson said, we can grapple with these. And so for me, it was less about, yes, he passed this legislation or that, and more about creating an atmosphere that says, we are responsible as a nation for the greater good of our people. That means we have to believe in things that people didn't think were possible. And Lyndon Johnson, had the ability to both believe and to implement. What a skill. Secretary Lonnie Bunch, what a pleasure for us to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's always my pleasure to be with you. I remember when Sputnik went up. And after dinner, Daddy and I would walk down to the cemetery and we'd look up at the sky to see if we could see Sputnik up there. And we, a lot of the people complained and said, you can keep your eyes on the stars, we're gonna keep our feet on the ground. Daddy was very interested in space and he was majority leader when the Sputnik went up and he saw this as a great danger, that we were going to fall behind, we were gonna become a second class country if we didn't do something about space. He knew it was something that we should be a part of and now we have the challenge to find a way to use that information and technology to preserve it and make this a better place for everybody in the world. As that Sputnik moment suggests, Lyndon Johnson deserves enormous credit for launching the U.S. space program, which today is moving humanity back to the moon and beyond that to Mars. Our next speaker, Anusha Ansari, burst onto the international stage as the first Iranian woman and the first female Muslim to travel into outer space. Together with her husband, Anusha founded the Texas-based company Prodeif Systems to disrupt the Internet of Things market. She is best known for her role as CEO of the XPRIZE Foundation, funding transformative technology to bring us closer to a safer, more sustainable planet. Anusha will be interviewed by veteran journalist and Sellers Easton Media co-CEO Nina Easton 
Welcome, ladies. Our next guest, Anusha Ansari, exemplifies everything that we're celebrating tonight at the 50th anniversary of the LBJ School. Anusha, you are a big thinker, a big innovator, somebody who does big action. Uh, it's really great to have you here. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. We were hoping that we'll be all together in the auditorium, but I guess Zoom has to do. <laughs> exactly. Well, you're and you're somebody who's familiar enough with technology to uh, to be able to adapt to anything. Um, the other thing I should have mentioned about you, Anusha, is that you're an immigrant. Uh, you immigrated here from Iran. Tell us what brought you to the United States. Well, I um, was born and grew up in Iran until I was about 16 years old. And then uh, we moved to United States so I can continue my studies and, and uh, get a really good education and build an amazing future, um, hopefully. That was at least the hope for my parents. Um, and, uh, and it was a great move and it was hindsight. Uh, it was the best thing that happened in my life because it allowed me to become an engineer, an entrepreneur, and eventually uh, pursue the dream I had since I was a child, which was uh, becoming an astronaut and going to space. What was it about going into space that got you going? What was the inspiration for you? Um, it started when I was really young. Um, I remember that summer nights we would sleep outside, it was cooler. So I would sleep outside on the balcony and uh, I would look at the night skies and it was like this playing ground for my imagination. I was able to imagine worlds and beings that I had never encountered. And I was making up stories as I went. And I thought that there's all these mysterious things out there. I didn't know what the stars are and, and if there are other aliens, alien beings out there. I even prayed for aliens to come and abduct me and take me with them. Uh, but it was sort of this playground uh, that allowed me to just uh, imagine things and, and uh, imagine futures, imagine what I'm going to do. And I wanted to know more uh, about, um, you know, the role I play in, in this world, in this universe. Why am I here? What, what am I doing? What am I supposed to do? And um, space was like um, this place that I can go and get my answers. And uh, that's why I wanted to go to space. And it got me interested to study math and sciences, love astronomy and cosmology. So it was all coming together and it was like the answers were up there. You actually became an astronaut. Tell us about that. Eventually, through a very um, convoluted way, um, when I came to U.S., I didn't speak English, didn't have any money like most immigrants. And, um, you know, I came here with a lot of ambition and desire to build a better life uh, with my parents. And uh, I um, started studying engineering. Um, I, um, I didn't think there is a Starfleet Academy to <laughs> apply to, but um, my chances, I knew my chances of actually getting into NASA was very low given all of the baggage I carried. Um, but um, nevertheless, um, I always also growing up loved making things. And, and I always thought that I would uh, be an inventor because um, in Iran, we didn't have a space program. So I always thought that I would invent this amazing thing that NASA would want to fly to space. So that's how I would actually, I have to go with my experiment to space and and do it. And eventually that's the seat I had on the Soyuz, which is the space flight participant seat, usually scientists uh, or other people who are not professional astronauts or career astronauts actually go to space. But um, I, um, you know, I became an entrepreneur eventually and um, my life took a different direction. However, I always knew that I will find a way to get back to my passion, which was going to space. And I, and I always knew that as long as I don't give up on that idea and on that dream that eventually I'll find a way. And the path presented itself eventually after I sold uh, my, uh, my company that we built with my uh, husband and um, met Peter Diamandis and through XPRIZE, that's how my path to space began. Let's talk about being in space because you've told me in the past, looking down at the earth actually changed your life. Tell us about that. 
Um, I always imagine how Earth and you know my experience in space would be like. You know, I imagined it in my head, and when I was up there, um, it was much better than anything I ever imagined, and it touched me deeply. It really transformed the way I looked at um, you know our world, but also my relationship with the world. One thing that becomes clear, even though we know it intellectually, but it sort of uh, becomes real, solidifies in our mind when we're up there, is that our home is this one planet we all live in. We grow up with the geography maps that have these lines that separate us into different countries. And we start believing that those lines actually exist and there are walls that separate us and we are separate from each other. But the reality is that we're not. And when you're in space and you're able to see our planet, it becomes obvious that we're all just beings living on this one home, one planet. And, and until we realize that and start treating it at this precious place we have and take care of it and work together, it will be very hard to see how our problems will go away. So it, it was really this realization that if people could see what I'm seeing here, if world leaders could see what I'm seeing here, would they make the same decisions they're making today? And how can that be transformational in the way our future would look like? And um, so that, that transformation in me is something that I've hoped and I've talked about a lot and I know a lot of other astronauts do the same. And we, we hope that people start seeing the world through that lens and through that perspective because it's empowering um, and it's, it's, uh, it gives us hope because we know that whatever challenge comes up, if we all come together, we can solve it. Now, of course, LBJ um, really doesn't get enough credit for his role in pushing forward the space program here and pushing forward NASA, but he was a huge force behind it. And it's interesting jumping forward these many decades and you look in the decade ahead of us coming forward, there's tremendous activity on the space exploration front with private sector players, with public sector. Um, we hear talk of going to the moon and using the moon to possibly as a launching pad to Mars. I mean, what do you think is going to be happening in the next decade? Give us an overview briefly. Of course. Um, there is um, a lot of hope for uh, this partnership that has been forged uh, between the private and public sector, which advancing things at a much uh, faster rate. I definitely think we'll have a base on the moon because if we want to go to Mars, we need to practice. So uh, moon will become our practice ground. But beyond that, I think we're going to start using resources in space to help us here on Earth. Um, there's always a possibility and people have done a lot of studies on how we can actually use a material from the surface of the moon to generate energy. Uh, I'm a big fan of finding ways to beam down solar energy from the orbit. Not only that, uh, the new business opportunities that are presenting themselves as the cost of access to space is coming down. One of the breakthroughs that I hope to see, and I talk about it almost in every forum, is that we have these data centers that consume massive amount of energy for power and cooling, and space has abundance of power and it's really cold. So why can't we start building these data centers in orbit and, and you know, relieve that burden from our planet? So there's a lot of opportunities like this will make in the next decade, will make a lot of great strides toward Mars. But I think Mars probably is a little bit of, of more than a decade away from us. Um, and it's a lot dif more difficult to go to a place where uh, you're not going to be able to see your home planet. Um, the radiation, the duration of the flight is a lot longer. I think our technologies for uh, orbital and, and suborbital flights will advance. So we will have opportunity for more people to experience what I experienced. So let's talk about the X Prize, which you are, um, where you're CEO and, and you are very much using that program as your part of your central mi mission around sustainability and, and helping the earth um, and, and around climate change in particular. Tell us about the X Prize and tell us about some of those climate change sustainability initiatives that you're doing. 
Um, I have been actually um, serving on the board of X Prize since its early days when uh, my family and I sponsored the first prize, the Ansari X Prize, which really opened up this commercial space opportunity. But um, what that competition proved is that this model works well when you have a big complex problem that's not being addressed and you can bring the innovation of the world from every country from uh, regardless of their age, their background and, and this innovative engine that can come to focus on a problem will come up with the best solutions. And the other thing that XPRIZE does uh, through this uh, lens of shining a light on the problem and bringing people's attention to it opens up investment opportunities. So the teams usually get a lot of investment when they start working on an XPRIZE. So, uh, and sorry, XPRIZE, the $10 million actually brought $100 million worth of investment and the new marketplace that's created now, it's worth billions of dollars. So we try to replicate that looking at all the other grand challenges in the world. Um, and we've been looking at climate as one of the most important challenges that we face. And we have launched many um, competitions around um, healthy oceans. Uh, we have an active competitions for uh, uh, carbon um, use and uh, this is, this is the one I love if, if, yeah if I wanted it really to emphasize this one and an issue because you told me about this a while ago the taking carbon out of the atmosphere and creating products how does that work yes yeah, so we've done this in two steps we have an active competition where we're taking carbon out of the smokestack of a power plant and turn it into a consumable product and that uh, competition is actually in the final stages and we have people generating um, uh, all sorts of products from polymers, cement. Um, we have a company that's creating vodka um, and turned the vodka into hand sanitizer for, for the pandemic. All, all out of carbon? This is all made out of carbon? All made out of carbon. Mm -hmm. And also the second one that we were hoping to launch um, in 2020, but the world changed. So our sponsorship evaporated. Uh, it's the uh, it's one of the most important competitions I believe that we can launch and really make a difference. And that's looking at climate change and knowing that even if we start um, changing our behavior and put less carbon in the atmosphere, we still won't make the, the barrier of two and a half degree that we are all concerned about. So we need to take carbon out of the atmosphere and do it at scale. So we are trying to put a competition to advance technologies to take carbon out of the atmosphere at gigaton levels. And I think that would be a very important competition for us to launch. Um, we also have a rainforest competition going on right now. So if there are teams out there, students in the audience, uh, I really encourage you to go to our website. There will be a link in the chat so you can go learn more about our work and actually form teams and compete because all we need is willingness and passion of young innovators to say, I'm going to solve this problem, find a few others to join your team and then go for it. So what's your prognosis about um, planet Earth and climate change. It's been a rough year on that front as well. Absolutely. Actually, the pandemic not only caused us a lot of uh, lo losing a lot of life, uh, but um, also it has put us back uh, in many aspects around uh, climate. We've seen a lot of um, PPEs that are one time use. Uh, people have gone to using plastic and straws and everything. All those advancements we had. Uh, started to make, which was very promising, we sort of uh, stepped back in a time that we really can't afford to step back. And our, um, it, right at the beginning of the pandemic, everyone was talking about how they can see more birds and the sky is blue and the water is clear, but that was very short lived. Uh, and it was well, artificial. Of course, you're in Los, you're, excuse me, you're in Los Angeles, my hometown, home state, and we've yeah. seen the fires there are just. Oh, absolutely. That's another uh, manifestation of climate change. But I think that that glimpse to what it could be was supposed to tell us we can change it oh, if we want to. And, and uh, so I'm hopeful that we can, but it requires really collaboration between countries, governments. I think uh, we can 
uh, come up with technologies that will help us on this transition. But most importantly is the willingness of different nations to say, this is a real problem and we need to do something, not because we want to save the planet. The planet doesn't need saving. We need to do this to save ourselves because the planet will be here just like the dinosaurs disappeared and the planet Earth was still here. We could disappear and the planet Earth will be here. So we need to do it for ourselves and our future generation and our children. And so what are the, some of the future initiatives that you have at XPRIZE that you are excited about and hoping will make a difference? Well, of course, uh, we have a lot of focus on, on climate. So uh, as I mentioned, the carbon extraction is one of the ones that we're very excited. We also have a prize design that's partially funded and we're looking for additional sponsors around wildfire because that's not just a problem in the US. You know, we saw how it devastated Australia and it's all over the globe. So that's about finding ways that um, far, fires can be detected very rapidly and is extinguished quickly. So this is all uh, automated through drones and other technologies that the innovators would come up with. Um, so that's an important one I think we need to do. We have um, also a competition that we'll be launching soon um, to help talk about the uh, importance of having clean sources of meat and sustainable sources of meat for uh, for the world, for our growing population. And I'm excited about that. Uh, we have a lot around pandemics and, and the um, and data, um, gender biases, racial biases that can be um, detected and help being solved through um, having this data. And so we have a lot of collaboration with the ITU and other UN agencies around uses of artificial in uh, intelligence for good and towards solving the SDGs. Um, we've been very busy. We have a lot of uh, rapid COVID testing and um, a, a reskilling challenge to help people who've lost job uh, find jobs that are going to be growing in the future. Um, and uh, we have um, a new mask challenge uh, for kids, actually the younger innovators between 14 and 25 um, to come up with the mask that's comfortable and cool and everyone would wear. So we have a combination of uh, competitions that are focused on short-term challenges and some that are focused on big grand challenges of the world and how we can solve them. So Anusha, as we wrap up here, could you give us some thoughts about innovation and about thinking like an innovator. What have you learned? What guidance can you give uh, to people, to young leaders who want to cross boundaries and you know, shattered class and, and really uh, make change? What, what's your advice? So a couple of things. One is I think, um, we're not born innovators. We don't wake up today and say, hey, I'm gonna invent something. I think it, come, uh, it starts with curiosity. Uh, I've learned that, uh, you know, I start caring about the subject uh, when I, I get curious about it and start learning about it. Um, something, you know, grabs my attention and I don't let it go and I start trying to figure it out and learn it. And through that process, if it's something that you end up caring for, you develop a passion and attachment to it and, and a desire to make it better, to solve it, to help re-engineer it, uh, whatever that topic is. So I think that's where innovation comes in. Once you get curious and start asking questions, that engine of creativity and imagination kicks in and you start coming up with new ideas. And, and that's how, everything gets solved and everything gets resolved. So um, something that I've seen also keeps people from actually talking about their ideas because at this stage is all in your head. The next stage is, okay, I need to talk about it. Um, and people sometimes are uh, afraid to be ridiculed or to fail. And that's what keeps us uh, from actually voicing our ideas. And that's the biggest mistake we make. If I had not told people I want to go to space, I would not get, you know, to meet Peter or to be um, uh, to meet people who will help me eventually get there. So it's important if you have an idea, even if you don't think it's a brilliant idea, others may think so. So even if you think it's a crazy idea, at the X Prize we have a saying that 
um, every breakthrough uh, before the day it becomes a breakthrough is a crazy idea. So even if you have a crazy idea, talk about it. Um, you don't have to have all the expertise. When Once you start talking about it, you'll meet people who are experts and they get engaged in your conversation and they will start helping you. So that's sort of the steps that I've seen work for most people who come up with brilliant ideas. So I think from now on, instead of innovators, we're gonna start talking about crazy idea promoters. Um, Anush Ansari, thank you so much. You're such an inspiration. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for inviting me and letting me be part of your celebration. And uh, I am very happy that I was able to participate. Hopefully you'll invite me in real life next time. <laughs> okay, private tour of the library. Well, thank you again and thank okay. you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Anusha and Nina, for that inspiring discussion. Our next speaker taught here at the LBJ School as an assistant professor. He won his first political campaign and now serves as a U.S. Senator from Nebraska. Welcome, Senator Ben Sass. Good evening, everyone. It is wonderful to be here, although it would be even better to be in the same room together. You know, 110 years ago, one year after he left the office of the United States presidency, Theodore Roosevelt gave a special speech at the Sorbonne in Paris that still resonates today. The former president attacked those cynics who insist on looking down on people trying to make a difference in the world, trying to make the world a better place for our neighbors and kids. Quote, the poorest way to face life is to face it with a sneer, Roosevelt wisely cautioned his audience. He then went on to extol those citizens who actually dare to get in the arena of public leadership, striving valiantly, as he put it, willing to be marred by dust and sweat and blood. It is fitting that the Lyndon Johnson School, where I had the great privilege of teaching for five years, is celebrating its 50th anniversary with the theme, In the Arena, drawn from that celebrated TR speech. President Johnson and Lady Bird founded this School of Public Affairs during a similarly divisive time in our nation. I should note they did it out of their belief in the idealism and vision and determination of new generations of young leaders, young people willing to get in the arena. It was, at root, a belief born of optimism and hope. I have personally talked and written about much of the cynicism that infects our body politic today. Yes, there is too little public trust in politics, and public leadership is definitely an extreme sport too often these days. But that also means that there is room in the arena for an inspired new generation of leaders, leaders who will support thriving communities at the local level, leaders who believe in human-to-human -human relationships rather than tribal divisions. When I was on faculty, Elspeth Rostow always forced us, forced us to get face-to-face -face as we would wrestle through challenges. We need more of that. We need leaders who will bring us together to face the challenges of a complex and often uncertain future. The LBJ School's mission, per the 36th President of the United States, is to produce thinkers and doers, citizens willing to get into the arena. I'm honored to be a part of the LBJ School's heritage, and I wish the school, its students, and its eminent alumni and faculty all the best moving into the next 50 years. Good night. Thank you, Senator Sass. I'm personally pleased and honored to introduce James B. Milliken, Chancellor of the University of Texas System, responsible for one of the largest and most diverse public university systems in the United States. Like LBJ himself, he's committed to taking on tough issues around public education and doing so with inclusive, open dialogue and engagement. Joining the Chancellor as he shares insights on how universities need to reimagine the future is one of Austin's most notable residents, Pulitzer Prize winning author, Lawrence Wright. Gentlemen, welcome. Well, JB, it's good to see you, neighbor. Um, we live right across the fence from each other. Uh, I'd like to begin this by talking about Texas and the University of Texas and where it fits into this. You know, LBJ in 1930 was a school teacher when uh, that back in those days, uh, uh, there were, I think, six million Texans. 
And now we're five times larger than that. And we're the second largest state in the union, the third youngest. And we're growing so quickly that by 2050 is projected we're going to double in size, at which point will be the size of New York and California combined. So what does that mean? It means that the future of America is Texas. And I don't think Texans have taken on quite how serious this is. Uh, and in so many respects, the future of Texas, to some extent, is the University of Texas. So why don't we talk a little bit about what the University of Texas means to the state and what it projects to do in the future. Sure, thanks, Larry. Um, so, you know, the population is, is as you said, going to double in, in 30 years. And um, it'll be a young population that will need education from uh, pre-K through college. Um, the good news is we have a lot of higher education in Texas today, but the bad news is we're still, uh, uh, we have no bragging rights on educational attainment. We're 34th in the country in the percentage of our population with a bachelor's degree. So if we add to that, uh, just say twice as many uh, people that need to get uh, degrees uh, over the next several decades, we're completely unprepared for it. Uh, we are not going to build um, the kinds of uh, large, expensive institutions that are wonderful institutions uh, Texas and others uh, to address this growth. We're going to have to find other ways to do it. And it's not just that the population is going to double, but uh, every year we see predictions that more and more new jobs will require education beyond high school. So the future of work factors in here too, and the need for more people with degrees and more people retooling and reskilling throughout their, uh, throughout their lives and their careers. So how are we going to do that? Well, it's going to be a variety of ways. And um, COVID has actually compressed, I think, to some degree, the time that it was going to take us to prepare for this. But one is, it's obvious, technology is going to change the way we educate a lot of people. We're going to do a lot more online. Um, we're going to have to do more uh, community college education across the state. It, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the uh, numbers of community college students in the country surpassed the number of uh, four-year college students in the country. And I believe that'll continue to grow, uh, not only because they offer uh, less expensive education typically, and then students can transfer to senior colleges, but also because I think we're going to need more career education. We're going to need more education that prepares people immediately for technical jobs uh, in the workplace. We're going to need more early college in high school, which is a trend that Texas has embraced and has been embraced around the country. There's no reason we can't do much more of that. Uh, so it's a combination of things that we will need to try to, A, increase the attainment rates uh, uh, in Texas so that we can be the most competitive state in the country and provide uh, Texans with the most opportunity, uh, but also, um, embracing the challenge of, uh, of a new workplace with increased uh, automation and robotics and artificial intelligence, which is gonna require a lot of us, maybe even you and me, Larry, to, uh, to do some reskilling. Well, I, I think a lot about that. I mean, the, the number one job in America is truck driving. And you know that's up to be totally automated uh, really soon. I, I just think this reskilling is going to be a big future, a uh, big part of our future. And you know, with so many things that have gotten cheaper over the years, we've gotten used to paying less for durable goods, for instance. Um, one thing that hasn't gotten cheaper for the most part is is higher education. And and there's a lot of question about you know. Is it a good investment uh, in your future? If you're going to take $100,000 uh, and put it into something, would it be education? Would that be the first thing you'd go to or would it be Amazon stock? Well, um, don't take my word for it. Take Warren Buffett's word for it. Yeah. I asked him this once and he said, the best single investment that you can make is in yourself and in your education. And so uh, uh, I, uh, I agree with him on that. You have this on your mind, <laughs> and this really that's great. I still think that um, public higher education 
is a tremendous value. Um, the, the, 70% of the degrees awarded in this country are in public uh, higher education. And uh, that's really the difference maker. That's, that's how we're going to, to, to equalize the playing field, to provide the, the opportunity that, that, that people need. Now, the funding for uh, public higher education has changed over the years, not just in Texas, but uh, across the country. 1986 was the high watermark for the uh, state contribution to, to uh, college and universities budgets, uh, meaning that it was the, the time that the highest percentage of an individual college or university's budget was paid by the state. In almost every state in the country now, tuition exceeds uh, the state contributions. Texas better than, than many, and that's a, a, a tribute to our, our leadership. But um, people have had to bear more and more of the burden of education. And in part, the federal government's provided um, a much greater uh, uh, number of Pell Grants uh, and loan programs to help students. Um, and for the most part, it is still a, a tremendous investment. And uh, people who get an education not only increase their earning power over a million dollars on average uh, over their career, but almost every other social indicator goes up with educational attainment, lifespan, health, um, about everything, civic uh, participation. So it's not only important for individuals to increase their, not only their earning power, um, but their quality of life, but it's fundamentally important to the state that wants to be as competitive as possible and lead the world. Yeah, I think that leading the world is, is, a, is a key because we're, we're, gravity is moving in our direction. Uh, and I'm glad we got the University of Texas on the case. Uh, we're in the middle of uh, an extraordinary period in our history. Uh, this pandemic has, has reset the table. I don't think anybody really knows what it's going to be like when the clouds clear again. But our life is changing, uh, not just momentarily. And I'm wondering how in the world of education you're dealing with it and what is this, what a part of it do you think will be a permanent part of the experience of going to college? Yeah. Well, Larry, if anybody has a sense of uh, what it's gonna look like or when yeah. this will be over, you do. So um, I'll take your advice on that. Um, you know, a lot of things have happened and, and, and um, you know, you hate to say that they're uh, any positives that have come out of this, given the, uh, the tragedy, the hardship, the, the, the deaths and, il and illness. Um, but the response of uh, many elements in our society, I think, has been really, uh, really impressive um, and encouraging. Um, you know, in February of last year, or, I'm sorry, February of this year, we had um, fewer than 20% of our faculty had taught online and fewer than 40% of our students had ever taken a course online. By April, the number was 100% in both categories. This is one of the most remarkable things I've seen in 32 years in higher education. The fact that um, people who either didn't want to or didn't know how to, or for a variety of reasons thought it wasn't as, uh, as high a quality education to teach online, all of a sudden pivoted in a couple of weeks time in Texas at the University of Texas system, but also across the nation. And so what happened instead of having a, a lost generation of students was students persisted, students were on track to graduate, graduated. Now the graduation wasn't quite as satisfying. It was either done in a drive-in movie theater or a parking lot or completely online, but they graduated. They got, uh, uh, achieved the goal that they had hoped to that they saved for, paid for, studied for. So this is a remarkable achievement, I think. And we're doing the same thing this fall and we'll do the same thing in the spring. Um, but, and people have gotten much better at it. And I think I was talking to a group of distinguished faculty the other day who, who have won awards for teaching in a very traditional sense. And they love that interaction in a relatively small classroom environment with students. But to a person, they said, this has um, introduced me to a new world of technological tools that don't substitute. It's not put my lecture on Zoom. 
but they have, there are many ways to uh, add to the quality of an education. So I think we're gonna see much more uh, hybrid models of delivery in the future, even when we don't need to. And I, I think that's gonna be, um, uh, that's gonna be a value uh, to, uh, uh, to students and to, and to faculty. And we've already talked about the need to address this rapidly growing population. I do think that as we continue to improve the quality of the technology available for uh, instruction, we're gonna be able to meet people where they live, where they work uh, and deliver education in a, a way that they need it and will benefit from it. So bricks and mortar, not so much, but you know, the, the interaction with people will continue, maybe not always as in person, but it'll, it'll, we'll still be able to reach people, maybe many, many more people than we did in the past. And uh, I guess that is a silver lining for this uh, really appalling <laughs> period of history that we're in. Well, JB, thank you. This has been very educational and uh, I appreciate your leadership and thanks for what you're doing for the state of Texas and all of our students. Thanks, Larry. Uh, you're a great neighbor uh, and a great interviewer. And I appreciate the chance to be with you tonight. My pleasure. We live in a world where there are more than 2 billion people who are overweight and nearly a billion who are malnourished. And my work is about bringing both of those numbers down to zero. My name is Alejandra Castillo and I am the CEO of the YWCA USA. And through our 210 associations, we touch the lives of over 3 million women through 1,200 communities. And the work that we do at the YWCA varies from early childcare, after school program, workforce development, and being the largest providers of services for survivors of domestic violence. What I think that we need in this country is a resilient and accessible regional food system where everybody can be closer and more connected to what it is that they eat. The thing that really gets me excited about food is the fact that everything connects with it. It connects with water, it connects with law, it connects with immigration, with women's rights. And I think that we as a society can put food at the center of every social ill and make some really big changes. I think one thing that everyone can agree with on LBJ is that he was big. He was tall, he had a big personality, and he had big ideas. His vision of the Great Society was something that uh, I feel we've lost and we need to fight to reclaim. And I'm also reminded of kind of the spirit of LBJ, which was to create the next cohort of public servants that are going to move this country forward. It is the excitement of becoming. Always, always becoming. becoming. Trying, trying, probing, falling. Falling, resting, and trying again but always trying and always gaining. I think that LBJ would be really surprised and maybe a little bit bemused by the collaborative nature of the school. When you look back at LBJ's legacy, that's exactly what he was contending with. A country that at the moment was in disarray, very polarized, and yet always focused on creating policies, programs that were going to address those issues, not just for the moment, but also for the future. It's hard to imagine doing the kinds of work that we've done in the past uh, to address food insecurity right here in Austin without the amazing students at the LBJ School. United States regain its leadership role in the midst of a global pandemic, threats from China and Russia, and its own domestic turmoil? Here with fresh and valuable insights is one of America's truly extraordinary leaders, Admiral William McRaven. As the commander of U.S. Special Operations Command, 
Admiral McRaven led a force of 69,000 men and women, conducted counterterrorism operations worldwide, and oversaw the 2011 Navy SEAL raid in Pakistan that killed Al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden. Since his 2014 retirement from the U.S. Navy, the four-star admiral has served three years as chancellor of the University of Texas system, and today he is, I am very proud to say, one of our very own, a professor at the LBJ School. Joining Admiral McRaven is a fellow foreign policy expert, author, and teacher, Douglas Brinkley, the Catherine Sanoff Brown Chair in Humanities and Professor of History at Rice University. What a pleasure it is to get to talk to Admiral William McRaven. He's somebody who uh, is a hero of mine, and we're really pleased that you're part of this celebration of the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Policy at the University of Texas, Austin. Admiral McRaven, when somebody says Lyndon Johnson, what does he mean to you, and what leadership lessons can we instill from his storied political career? Well, first, uh, Doug, thanks. Uh, thanks for taking the time to, uh, to join me today in, in celebration of the LBJ's uh, 50th anniversary. This is terrific. You know, when I think uh, of LBJ, obviously growing up here in Texas, LBJ was Texas. Uh, I mean, he was this kind of bigger than life, uh, you know, master of the Senate, uh, vice president, president, uh, everything that LBJ did kind of talked to the nature of Texas. Uh, and so as I thought about him, certainly growing up, he really kind of personified what we thought of as the best qualities of Texas. He had a swagger to him. He had a determination to him. He had a perseverance to him through some very challenging times. Of course, as I got older and began to really appreciate the remarkable work he did, the Civil Rights Act is really what resonates with me and how he had to kind of build these coalitions, how he had to kind of fight through some of those that weren't, uh, weren't necessarily for civil rights. So, uh, so I think when anybody in Texas reflects back on LBJ's legacy, it is a legacy of Texas, it is a legacy of the United States. And frankly, when you look at the impact uh, the civil rights movement in the US has had globally, it's a remarkable impact on the world. Uh, being part of the US Navy, how did that Civil Rights Act or the acts of the mid 1960s, do you think, uh change um, the face of, of the Navy, but all of our armed forces? Well, certainly when you, when you go back uh, in time with the military, you know, I think our first uh, African-American officer was maybe in the early 20s. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we had segregation throughout uh, World War I and World War II. Uh, and it really wasn't until 1948 when Truman signed uh, into act this uh, integration of the U.S. military that you really began to see the rise in the number of African-Americans and, and other people of color within the military. Now, candidly, uh, it didn't go as smoothly as, uh, as sometimes we think back on the history of the military. Uh, we had some tough times uh, in the 50s, in the 60s, but the civil rights movement really accelerated uh, the growth and the rise of these remarkable, remarkable African-American men and women uh, in the military. And I was fortunate in my career to have worked with some remarkable officers and, and enlisted. But again, it, it took a little while. Uh, but once we kind of, once we understood, we, the, the broader uh, community, understood the value of diversity, again, not just with African Americans, but with our Hispanic population, our Asian population, when we began to see the, the power of the diversity, it really changed everything in a positive fashion uh, about the, how the military uh, works and, and does business today. Well, here we are now, uh, you know, we're talking about the 60s, which was a tumultuous period. Here we are in 2020, and a lot seems to be unraveling around us all the time. And I wanted to tap on your expertise about U.S. foreign policy at this frozen moment that we're in. Um, first off, tell me your concerns about cybersecurity. Well, I don't so much worry about cybersecurity from the standpoint of the government infrastructure. Uh, now, if you'd asked me this question five years ago, and certainly 10 years ago, I would have had a different response. Uh, but with the establishment of U.S. Cyber Command, with the recognition on the part of corporate America uh, that, uh, and frankly, the, the, the state and federal agencies, the need to protect our grid, I think we do a pretty good job. That's not to say we're not attacked you know, thousands and thousands of times a day, 
But what you see is we have a pretty good mechanism for dealing with these both non-state actors and I think state actors in the cyber world. Where I worry about cyber is in the social domain, where you see the, uh, you know, all the social networks that are being attacked by Russia, by China, in an effort to undermine our elections, in, in an effort to sway people's opinions one way or the other. That is of greater concern to me than you know, somebody from Russia or China trying to shut down the New York Stock Exchange or open up a, uh, uh, a valve on a, on a dam somewhere. It's not that we don't need to be concerned about that. We do. But I think we have built the protocols and established um, the mechanisms to ensure that we can protect, you know, for the most part, our, our important national grids. Okay. What, what about China, where people are very worried that somehow China could declare a cyber war? But that aside, um, how should the United States, in your mind, be dealing with China? Are they an ally, or is it a, a country that we have to deal with uh, with a great you know deal of suspicion towards? Well, I see China as a competitor. Uh, I do not think that they are an adversary just yet. Uh, that doesn't mean they couldn't become an adversary. Certainly, what you see with China, from a military standpoint, which of course I'm I'm more familiar with. I mean, they have a military of, uh, of well over 2 million. Uh, and so quantity has a quality all its own. And when you think about China, uh, certainly from the, a naval officer's perspective, you know, the United States Navy has really for 75 years kind of dominated uh, the Pacific Ocean. And it has allowed uh, our allies in Japan, in the Philippines, in South Korea, uh, our allies across the Pacific uh, to realize that as long as they were partnered with America, uh, they were going to have you know, a safe and secure uh, place to live and work in the free flow of commerce. Uh, now what you see, of course, is China is beginning to uh, build additional infrastructure down off the Spratly Islands in the South China Sea. We see them expanding their, their military power. And while our military, our fighters, our aircraft carriers, our bombers, uh, while we uh, are a lot more technologically advanced, as I said, quantity has a quality all its own. So we in the United States military, particularly in the Navy, we're worrying about not just the Pacific, we're worrying about the Atlantic and the Mediterranean and all the other oceans in the world, whereas China really is focused on the Pacific. So they can bring to us uh, a lot of numerical superiority. Uh, having said that, I still think that our technology far surpasses China. My biggest concern with China, of course, is they are beginning to invest in AI and machine learning in a way that we are not. Now, it's not to say that the private sector isn't investing a lot in it, but from a government standpoint, we see a downturn in the amount of government investment in AI and machine learning. While I still think we, the United States, are far superior to China in these areas, I think we need to, to uh, kind of wake up and realize we're kind of at that Sputnik moment where we're beginning to see this rise of China, uh, we need to do something about it. Or in 10 years, I do think China will surpass us in AI and machine learning. And that will be a real problem because AI and machine learning, I really think are going to be the key to the future in terms of everything from the economy to healthcare to the military. You know, you had such an incredible role in uh, Operation Neptune Spear, the targeting and eventually killing of Osama bin Laden. How are we doing right now in the Middle East? Um, you know, where sometimes we hear about peace accords and other times everything seems to be unraveling. Uh, what's going on in the Middle East and what should we be concerned about and what should we be feeling like we've done well? I think this is, is just unfortunately the nature of the Middle East. Uh, the Middle East is a complex area. Uh, we've had, we have some great allies in the Middle East and, uh, and we have some strong adversaries in the Middle East. Having said that, you know, we have uh, learned over decades how to operate in the Middle East. You know, about uh, a year ago when there was the, the beating of the drums in, in terms of, you know, go, are we going to go to war with Iran? Frankly, I was never concerned about us going to war with Iran because the Iranians don't want us to go to war with them and, and we don't want to go to war with Iran. We have learned over time how the Iranians work in the Persian Gulf, in the Gulf of Oman. We understand there's this kind of tit for tat in terms of how the great game is played uh, in the Middle East. Uh, so I'm not overly concerned about Iran. That's not to say we shouldn't be concerned about Iran, uh, but I'm not overly concerned that they are going to be a threat uh, to U.S. military power in the region. Uh, having said that, I do think we need to pay particular attention 
uh, to what Iran continues to do on the state sponsor of terrorism. And that's an area that uh, we always have to keep an eye on. You know, as you, as you kind of make your way around uh, the Middle East, uh, you know, again, we have some, some great allies. I have to applaud the president. I think this, uh, this initiative uh, with Israel and the UAE and now Bahrain, uh, you know, I have uh, some modicum of hope that this will not lead to Middle East peace as we have uh, kind of defined Middle East peace in the past in terms of the Palestinians and the Israelis. But I do think it, it puts us in a better place in the Middle East strategically. And, and hopefully we can get more Arab countries to sign on. Having said that, uh, the Middle East will always be complicated. When you look at Southwest Asia in terms of Afghanistan, uh, I've gone on record before, I'm not a fan of uh, brokering a peace deal with the Taliban. Uh, my concern with the Taliban is the peace deal will be about as, as, you know, as worth uh, the, the paper it's written on. Uh, as soon as we pull out of Afghanistan, the Taliban will you know, take back over within you know, six months to a year and we'll return to kind of pre 9-11 in terms of you know, what, what's happening in Afghanistan. All of that said, uh, I remain optimistic about the Middle East because we have learned so very, very much, uh, painfully, I would offer, uh, with a lot of loss of life and a lot of loss of, uh, of credibility in some cases. But we've learned a lot uh, on how to uh, operate both militarily and politically in the Middle East. And I think we'll be able to continue to manage it for the US and our allies' interest uh, for a long time to come. Well, what about NATO? Is it starting to unravel or become frayed? Uh, when I did my doctorate at Georgetown, that was the big deal I studied was the, uh, I actually became an Atlanticist. And as long as NATO stays together, the world is safe. What's happening with NATO uh, right now? And do you think the alliance is viable uh, at this point in the 21st century? Yeah, I'm a big supporter of NATO. Uh, as you may know, I was the commander of the NATO Special Operations Force. I think NATO is as viable, if not more viable now than it has been in a long time. Because while I'm not overly concerned about China in terms of uh, the difference between uh, you know, a, a competitor uh, and an adversary, I am worried about Russia. And, and I do think Russia's aggressive tendencies, particularly uh, in the last couple of years, when you look like they're, when you look at their aggression in the Pacific, uh, making runs on, uh, on some of our ships at sea, uh, some of their fighters engaging some of our, uh, our aircraft in flight, um, you know, these are aggressive actions that concern me. NATO re really becomes the only bulwark we have uh, to stop Russian aggression uh, in, in Europe. Uh, so I think we need to continue to strengthen uh, the NATO alliance. And it's not just about Europe, frankly. NATO and our NATO colleagues have been great allies, great friends, as we have uh, tackled a lot of complicated problems around the world. What about, I'm going to ask you a few names of people you've worked with. What's, what's Barack Obama? What, what is, how was he as a leader? Well, I thought he was a fabulous leader. Um, and having had a chance to work very closely with him over my time uh, as a three-star and a four-star, uh, you know, the, the, the American public and I think the world didn't have a chance to see the nature of the decisions that he made on a daily basis, certainly with regard to military operations and in particular counterterrorism operations. Everybody knows about the bin Laden raid, but what they don't know about are the dozens of other missions we conducted uh, kind of globally that required the president's uh, um, approval. And therefore the president had to be involved in the decision process to go after bad guys. And, uh, and he, was, he was very aggressive, he was very thoughtful, uh, he gave me as the leader the latitude to do the job I needed to get done. Uh, so I've said before, I, I was uh, both surprised and pleased by the degree of leadership. Uh, you know, he seemed to me to have had the leadership capabilities of somebody that I would have thought spent 35 years in the military. When, we'd sit, when we would sit in the situation room, uh, he would allow everybody to go around the room to express their concerns, their issues, uh, their thoughts on the, on the complexity of the crisis and, and how we could resolve it. Uh, he would ask the hard questions. Uh, he would make sure that, uh, that you, you didn't get off the hook until you answered the question or you could, you could find the answer somewhere. But then at the same time, he recognized that certainly on the military side, you had to give the military leaders, and I would also offer uh, the leaders in the intelligence community, the latitude to do the job that, that they knew how to do, and then kind of step back and let them do it. Uh, so I found him to be a, a remarkable leader and very personable as well. What about um, Joe Biden? What, what's he like? 
Well, I, I, much like uh, Obama, actually, in terms of uh, kind of a personality. Again, there's this, there's this kind of no drama Obama idea out there. And, and actually, when you spend a little time with the president, uh, President Obama, you find that he is, is very uh, gregarious. He's got this dry sense of humor, uh, very engaging, and again, equally thoughtful. When, when you're around Joe Biden, of course, uh, candidly, you get the feeling that you are his best friend. He just has this ability to, uh, you know, to, to, to be warm and embracing, but also very thoughtful, uh, very pointed at times. And, uh, and while he has this, uh, this tendency to come across, uh, again, like, like your, your best friend, make no mistake about it, uh, he will drive a hard bargain when he needs to. Uh, he will ask the pointed questions. If he de disagrees with you, he will make sure you know it. Uh, and if you've stepped out of line uh, or haven't done something appropriate in terms of, uh, you know, what the expectation was, he will come back and, and want to hold you accountable for doing that. So, uh, again, my time with both President um, Obama and, uh, and Vice President Biden was, uh, uh, was, again, very inspiring for me. But I would also offer that my time with, uh, with George Bush, Bush 43, uh, I found President Bush uh, to be equally thoughtful and equally gregarious and equally engaging and equally providing the military commanders the latitude to do the job. Admiral McRaven, uh, I know you work with the LBJ school and you meet all these uh, wonderful young people. What would you tell them? How can they be leaders of tomorrow in America? Yeah, in my graduate course that I teach at the LBJ school, um, and it is a course on public policy and leadership, and I ask the students, uh, or I, I tell the students, the one question they have to ask themselves uh, whenever they are making a tough policy decision or a national security decision is, who are we? Or who are you? But who are we as a nation? Well, we are a nation of people, you know, we the people. Therefore, if we're gonna make a decision, we need to understand that it is about the people. We are a nation of laws. We are a nation that believes in these unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And recognizing who we are, who we are as a nation, uh, who we are as a state, who we are as a person, is going to allow us to make a better decision uh, in our life, and, and certainly uh, from a public policy standpoint. Having said that, I would also offer that I tell folks, look, how you lead is about your character. And if you think for a second, that you don't need integrity and you don't need honesty and you don't need you know, the qualities that make you a good human being in order to lead well, I would offer that, that that is a fatal flaw in your thinking. You have to have a strong character. If you do not, whatever organization you build will be a house of cards and it will collapse. So you need qualities like courage and humility and the sense of sacrifice and perseverance and a sense of humor and, a, and an ability to forgive when things don't go well. These are great personal qualities that will reflect how you lead as well. If you are not an honest person, then you will not be honest in your dealings with other people. And if you are not honest in your dealing with other people, it will affect their ability to trust you. And if they can't trust you, you will never be able to lead in a tough, difficult environment. Well, thank you very much, Admiral McRaven. Your whole life has been really devoted to leadership, and we thank you. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Admiral McRaven and Mr. Brinkley for those extremely valuable insights and your hope for America's future. I'm thrilled to welcome two people who truly represent America's future. You all know Pete Buttigieg, Mayor Pete, the Rhodes Scholar from South Bend, Indiana, who enlisted in the US Navy, served in Afghanistan, and this year became the first openly gay person to win a presidential primary or a caucus. Joining Pete is Stacey Abrams, an LBJ school alum who served as the first African-American woman leader of either party in the Georgia House of Representatives. Stacey served for 11 years, including seven as Democratic leader. Last year, as a Democratic nominee for governor of Georgia, she won more votes than any other Democrat in the state's history. Stacy and Pete are still in the early stages of remarkable careers of public service, and they are with us today to share lessons learned and visions for a future of democracy based on belonging and empowering everyone. Hello, Stacy. Hello, Pete. It's so wonderful to have you here with us. 
on our 50th anniversary. You know, uh, President Johnson always thought about, he always talked about thinkers and doers. And on, in front of us today are two of the most incredible thinkers and doers of this generation, of your generation, and I'm so pleased to have you. Each of you came to public service in a very different way. Um, Stacy, you came through, you know, running for office and uh, through your public service in the state of Georgia. And Pete, you went through the military and then went back to South Bend and, and went back to Indiana and South Bend and ran for office. What moved you to actually step into public service? Was it something that you saw? Was it something that you felt you were born with? What really moved each of you uh, to come into public service and to stay in it? Uh, so I'm gonna start with Stacy. Mine was indoctrination. <laughs> My parents were working class and for them to take care of each other was really about service that no matter how little we had, there was someone with less, your job was to serve that person. For me, that evolved into wanting to understand government because as righteous and wonderful as my parents were, these two parents and their six kids weren't going to fix the challenges we saw in the deep South. And so I really focused on how did government play a role? What role did the nonprofit space have? And how could I intersect those two to help create the world that I wanted? So I started out as a bureaucrat working for the city of Atlanta as an attorney and when I realized politicians wouldn't necessarily do what you told them, I decided to run for office and join them myself. It's great. Pete, how about you? Well, I grew up in a family that uh, we weren't politically connected. I don't remember ever meeting an elected official uh, growing up, but very politically aware. My parents were always glued to the TV, sometimes yelling at the TV. And, and so I grew up with a sense of the importance of of kind of world affairs and, and national affairs, got to college and was kind of soaked in uh, a lot of the, the uh, lore around the, the Kennedy presidency, um, only to realize as I came home that uh, so much of where, where politics really matters is a much more intimate local level. Uh, and, uh, you know, my, my city had been written off as a dying city. Uh, we've been through a lot since the loss of the factories that really dated back to the 60s and found myself part of this generation that, that cared about the place that said, you know, we, we can either keep complaining, uh, keep leaving, or do something about it. And began to realize that, you know, there was a chance to actually take things into our own hands. And, th and that was the, the kind of trajectory that led to my running for mayor, but also building an administration with people from, uh, largely from my generation, as well as people who've been in public service for longer, all of whom wanted to see our community change. And, and I think that um, <clears throat> that kind of perspective, having studied politics at the kind of national and international uh, level as a student, but then done it and lived it at a local level, really uh, shaped my understanding of what, what it means to be involved in, in public service, whether it's, it's political or otherwise. Uh, and I, I try to carry that with, with me now, uh, even as we have these kind of world historical moments swirling around us. Uh, I know both of you have been thinking about this for a long time. A lot of it has to do with your surroundings and your family and all the people that you've come in contact with. And one of the things I find that, uh, especially among young people uh, and in schools who are actually studying to work into the, in the public policy, is failure. You know, they're not used to failing. They're used to succeeding. And, you know, and when they fail, they feel like, uh, they, they don't really know how quite to recover from their failure. And I know both of you have had failures in your political uh, careers. So can you talk a little bit about how you cope with the failures and how that's changed you um, as a person uh, and as somebody who's working in a very uh, difficult uh, situation in terms of uh, the bows and arrows that come at you almost every day in a political arena. So um, Mary Pete, do you wanna start with that? Yeah, I think, you know, honestly, the business world does a better job of recognizing that success and failure together are, are part of how innovation works and how growth comes. Politics a little less so, just because I think that the narratives are, are less forgiving. And so, uh, you know, before my first successful campaign, uh, I ran for state treasurer of Indiana. It's a long story how I got involved, but basically uh, it was a fight over whether the uh, Obama administration had done the right thing in rescuing the auto industry. Uh, the, the, the incumbent believed that, uh, uh, that that was the wrong thing to do and actually tried to block uh, the auto rescue, which would have been catastrophic here in Indiana. And I thought somebody needed to stand up to him. Uh, and so I ran, not really knowing what was involved in that, built a campaign, nobody'd heard of me, almost nobody had heard of the office I was seeking. 
And this was 2010. Uh, so you can imagine this is one of the worst years for Democrats ever, uh, running as a Democrat in a deeply red state on a platform of defending the then unpopular uh, Obama-Biden economic policy. And fairly predictably, I got crushed. It was like 60-40, not even close. And I learned a lot from that. Uh, first of all, I learned how to campaign, win or lose. Mm. Uh, but I also learned that the sun comes up the next day and you're still you. And when you dust yourself off from having put everything that you have uh, into a campaign and tried to bring as many people as you could along with you uh, and recognize that you're still the same person when you, when you get up in the morning and that uh, you know, the same things you care about still matter. Uh, it, it, I think, helps you get that thicker skin that, that's really important for, uh, for politics. So if somebody can get through a, a career in, in public service without ever uh, having a major defeat, that's great. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, at the same time, mine, you know, unlike uh, uh, what Stacey experienced, uh, you know, I was beat fair and square, <laughs> to be clear. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, and that, you know, was as instructive a campaign as any of the winning campaigns that, that, that I ran afterwards. I think one of the things you just hit on, Mayor Pete, is exactly what we were trying to think about in terms of school. How do you give people the experience of failure, getting thick skin, getting scarred, and then not taking it personally? You know, you start thinking about how you can grow a character, how you can take that failure and make something good out of that failure. And Stacy, you know about that. So Stacy, why don't you talk to us about your experiences? Well, I, I think Pete's absolutely right that there is a difference in industry and in uh, spaces, how failure operates. But I think it's also important that we acknowledge failure operates differently for communities of color, for women, for the disadvantaged, because often you get one shot. And the presumption is if you couldn't leverage that shot, then clearly you weren't capable. Or worse, if someone who looked like you had that shot and didn't accomplish it, none of you were eligible. I think my most public failure is probably one of the examples of how I've learned to navigate it, which was I ran for governor. I ran a very competitive campaign. We transformed the composition of the electorate in ways that no one had seen in the South in you know, decades. And yet I had an opponent who also leveraged his power to ensure his victory. My response was to be very intentional about creating a new space to stand in. And I think what was interesting or different certainly about my reaction was that I think we also have to parse out what failure looks like. So I gave my non-concession speech where I acknowledged the legal sufficiency. No matter what happened, no matter how it came about, I didn't become governor. And that, is, that means I failed. It means I didn't get the thing I was going for. And it's entirely possible to acknowledge that something didn't occur but to also investigate what could have been done differently. And I think one way that Pete and I are so similar, and when we met in 2016, one of the moments of sort of connectivity was, there's a, there's a lesson in that, but there's also opportunity in that. And so for me, I had plenty of time on my hands. I <laughs> took the next two years to build organizations to tackle the very concerns that I faced as a candidate. Pete and I don't get to hide the things that have happened. We don't get to pretend, often you get to fail in silence, but when you fail on national television, it's a big deal. Uh, and so part of, I think the lesson to be gleaned is there's a utility to failure, but you have to understand all of its contours. It's not black and white. And there is both a comfort in it, but there's also a power in it. Because when you can use that lesson, when you can extract opportunity and then when you can convert those opportunities into changes that help someone else not make those mistakes or not face those challenges, then that's where service really enters the space. What you just said, I was going to think, I was thinking about asking you all about the American people and what you've learned uh, in terms of all the campaigns uh, and all the people that you've met through all of your journeys. The something you just said, Stacy, made me think of something else. When you think about failure, you know, people can relate to failure. Everyone has failed. It's a very human kind of feeling. So that's one way to connect with people. The other thing is how you use those failures to educate people about systems and under, you know, structures and organizational um, weaknesses. And I think this is something you're touching upon, how you can use the totality of all of your experiences to help educate the American public, not only about you, um, but about our democracy. 
So what I'd like to talk about a little bit is you've been around and seen a lot of people, a lot of Americans in a lot of different situations. What do you see as some of the enduring qualities of Americans, no matter where you go, what are you seeing of some of the commonalities of the American people? Pete? Well, one thing that I see everywhere I go is a, a level of just uh, what I would call uh, maybe uh, values on how to do things. So before you get to our political values, our, our ideological values, just a sense of uh, a desire for uh, fairness uh, and a desire to be regarded uh, that I think in the right way could bind together a lot of constituencies uh, that are wedged off against each other in various ways right now. Um, but that actually have so much in common. And, you know, when, when you, one of the things I would always be on the lookout for, especially when I was running for president, was any kind of gap or difference or daylight between the things I was asked about most by reporters and the things I was asked about most by voters. And sometimes it was a very specific issue. And a good example is mental health. Uh, I was asked constantly mm -hmm. about mental health uh, and addiction by voters much less so by commentators and, and reporters. But also in addition to individual policies, uh, again, uh, I think a deeper sense that brought people together of wanting the system to just work for them and recognizing all the ways that it doesn't, uh, whether it's ways in which our economic arrangements don't actually uh, reward uh, hard work in, in the proportion that, that uh, you would expect uh, or support people in their ability to, to thrive in the way that uh, many people, I think, just assume programs do. Uh, and the political system, uh, that we have such a, a deep, unwritten need to have trust in uh, that's being shaken in so many ways uh, and has been for years. In some cases, that trust was never uh, properly built in the first place. In others, it's been eroded, sometimes systematically. Uh, and it's one thing I'm, I'm very concerned about as we uh, enter into the final phases of, of, of this year's presidential campaign. Uh, what I find among people is, is a desire uh, to get those systems to somehow correspond to their everyday lived reality, uh, to see the decisions being made in big white buildings uh, actually line up with uh, their everyday lives and the vulnerability all of us have to the power flexed in, in those halls and, and, and the consequences of the decisions that are made. And my, my, my wish for politics and part of what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, uh, the direction I'm trying to push our politics into and by the way, one of the reasons I really admire uh, the work that, that Stacy does uh, in her uh, insistence that we have a political system that is more fair and more trustworthy is that it's up to us. Uh, the, the great paradox of our time is uh, a, a lot of institutions that have failed to be fully representative of us uh, will only become that way if we use them, rickety though they are, uh, to fix them. Uh, the, the, this quality of our systems to be responsive uh, imperfectly, but to be responsive to, our, to demands that they be improved. That's the entire ballgame. Right? Uh, and the, the big question is, will we be able to use those levers that were built into the system? Will we be able to grab hold of it to fix it before it's too late? Stacy, do you want to talk about this from your perspective? I think what I would add is that we exist in a nation of multi-strand identities. And there is a deeper empathy that exists among us when we are willing to acknowledge those strands and how they intersect, how they weave together. Uh, when I was running for office in Georgia, you know, we have 159 states. Georgia is physically the largest state east of the Mississippi, if you don't count the water in Florida. But what that meant was that I was going to places where they fought civil war battles and were very unhappy with the outcome of the, of the war. Uh, places where communities were denied access and agency and humanity for you know, much of the nation's you know, existence and communities that are newly formed, uh, having immigrated to the United States and are growing fast. And there's this notion that those are separate communities that have nothing in common, except they all live here. And I think if you extrapolate from that, sort of the larger national narrative, but what I found when I was running and I, I'm sure Pete saw this too, was that when you pulled one of those threads, when it was the mental health thread, or it was worrying about your children thread, or it was the healthcare thread, or even just, do I have an opportunity to, to think, to dream that we are all more connected by those pieces? 
And unfortunately, our politics have created this tension that says for you to pull on your thread means that someone else has to yank it back. Instead of thinking about how our politics can try to knit those things together and offer policies, but also offer frameworks for how we talk about these things. My politics, but also my American patriotism is grounded in this notion that my responsibility is to see how my threads can weave together with yours. And more importantly, how when we push them all together, we all become strengthened by these multiple identities that we don't have to separate them out. I cannot be just black or just a woman or just Southern. I am inherently all of those things. And those things have made me who I am. Those experiences have informed how I engage. And I have to be kind enough and empathetic enough to understand that the same thing is true for every person I see. And I, I think the one example that resonated for me was I was in North Georgia, which is largely white, largely rural, having a conversation about criminal justice reform. And I had the same conversation no matter where I went. And this older white man came up to me and he said, you know, are you thinking about my son too? And I said, of course I am. And the question that he was asking, and, and I, I'm bringing race into this because I think it's one of those dimensions that we too often allied that looms until we have to confront it. But what he did, what he wanted to know is, could I see the identity that he had of a, a, wee, a grieving father struggling with a child who had an opioid addiction that was consonant with my role as a sister who is grieving for my brother who was having his own challenges. And in that moment, we had a commonality that transcended our politics, transcended our region. I don't know if he voted for me or not, but I know in that moment, I gave him a connectivity that said that we were both American, we were both Georgian, we were both human and our needs could work together to make our country better. One of the things that both of you have touched upon is this idea of commonality. And you talked about it in terms of the people you've seen, the people you've met, uh, your experiences. I wanna translate that to how do you take that and move it to a political structure? So both of you have been in uh, elected offices where you've had to achieve something, you've had to work with those who are in opposition, whether in your own party or in a different party. So some of the things that you both touched upon in terms of how we relate to the American people is also what they expect people who are in political office to relate to each other. So I know, Stacy, you worked on tax legislation and Pete, you worked on the thousand uh, housing initiative. And also as mayor, you just go to the supermarket and people are right there. So you have to uh, relate to everybody on a very, very basic level. Talk to us a little bit about how you would translate what you've learned and what you've seen into and what you've done politically into how we have to bring uh, this bipartisan rancor back together to a place where we're really talking and discussing things civilly and in a constructive way. For seven years in the Georgia legislature, I was minority leader, Democratic leader of the House. And I would tell my colleagues, my job minority leader was Latin for lose well. Uh, by <laughs> its very nature, I would never have enough votes to accomplish any outcome unless I could work with the other side. And my rubric for that was one, I didn't believe that we had to have conversion of beliefs, of ideology. My responsibility was not to convert you from believing whatever you held to be true because I doubted you could do that to me. So why, what gave me the onus to think I could do it for you? And what arrogance is there to suggest that I should convert your ideology? I instead worked on convincing you that what we needed to do together had nothing to do with ideology and had more to do with outcome. And when we shift the focus from trying to change who a person is to trying to change how we do things, that moment of commonality, that moment of agreement allowed us to work together. We could be angry with each other and voting against each other the very next day, but in that space, we could work together. Pete, you wanna to talk to us about your experiences as well? Yeah, I think that point is really important. It's not always about uh, making sure, somehow imagining that, that someone who views the world very differently is suddenly gonna see the light and come to your way. It also, by the way, it doesn't mean that you have to just kind of take the average and, and, and water down your own values and find somebody somewhere in between. Sometimes uh, those things can melt away when it is about the outcome. So you, you mentioned one effort we had in the city when I was mayor, which was uh, we had a, a huge number of vacant and abandoned properties. 
uh, mostly in lower income areas, uh, uh, largely in uh, historically black neighborhoods, often owned by somebody who it was just a line on a spreadsheet to them that didn't even, you know, it would be some large uh, uh, owner of multiple properties around the country uh, for whom the, the values of our homes in, in, in uh, our neighborhoods had fallen so low that it wasn't even worth the bother of uh, selling them or getting rid of them to some of these property owners. So we knew we had this huge problem and a need to fix up or remove as many of these properties as we can. Um, that wound up being a really challenging thing to discuss politically. Who had felt abandoned by the city in, in many ways, uh, wondering whether this is something that would be done to them. Uh, people who were looking at what was happening around the country and the phenomenon of gentrification, wondering if that was what this was meant. Now in a neighborhood where to this day you can get a pretty good house for 25,000 bucks, gentrification, at least right now, uh, was not the, the, the main thing that was impacting the neighborhood. But uh, why not uh, uh, expect that if, you, if your trust had been abused repeatedly by the economy uh, and, and, and by the country? So we had to uh, have a huge amount of dialogue uh, in order to uh, make sure that we were really uh, uh, authentically putting together a plan where everybody's voice was heard. And even then we made mistakes and had to uh, change things as we went and, and adjust on the fly. It's all about, I think, good faith, good faith in the encounter, which again is not about agreeing. Uh, it's not about pretending to agree or believing that uh, one side will convert the other in terms of their deepest values. It's about figuring out what we actually want to get done. And uh, the thing I most fear right now is that uh, we're not coming to that uh, process even from the same field of fact. So if my interests or my values are different from your interests and your values and we're arriving in good faith, then we can talk about it. I mean, as mayor, I might have somebody in a, you know, getting in the way of something I wanna do in this neighborhood because they're a council member representing that neighborhood uh, and they view it as their job to fight for their area. And, and we just come together and we work something out. Um, at the national level, uh, putting together an agenda that's going to make sense for uh, people with, with maybe radically different values, but not such different interests is possible, but not if we're literally in different realities. And that is the environment that we have increasingly wandered into. Uh, and it really strips us, I think, of the ability to reach across the aisle, to reach across competing sets of interests and values, because we're not even talking about the same thing. Well, I think we could talk to you, both of you, for hours. You're so, um, you're so open and so articulate, and you're talking from the heart, and we really appreciate spending time with us. We just have a few seconds left, and I'd just like to give you some time. Uh, we're going to have a big election on November 3rd, and people uh, who need to trust in the government who need to understand that we can, we can come up with partisan, uh, we can eliminate partisan um, Rife, can you just give a one or two little thoughts to everybody who about voting, the importance of voting? Pete, you wanna go ahead? Sure, I guess what I'd say is that uh, everyone's moment of maximum power as a citizen is the moment that uh, you fill in that ballot. And so uh, for those who are still deciding whether to vote, and I know that's happened, uh, it's worth remembering that it is precisely because we don't have any illusions about the problems in the system that we must engage the tools that it does give us uh, in order to uh, make sure that, that we have a voice in fixing those problems. And we also know that uh, in, in uh, racially disparate ways, there are efforts to suppress that. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of work going on uh, that uh, uh, Stacy and, and others are leading uh, in order to make sure that, that, uh, uh, that we beat back those efforts to suppress the vote. But there are a lot of people where the suppression is actually uh, a battle going on inside. And it's a battle to have some level of faith uh, in an imperfect system. And the greatest faith we have to have in the system is not in its perfection, but in its capacity to be made more perfect. And that really is up to us. Stacy, I would add only one that voting is not a magic pill. It's not an instant solution. It is part of the process of change. It's the process of making the choices we need to make day by day and abdicating that responsibility, or I think in a very logical way, deciding that it doesn't work for you, does not mean that it can't work. Uh, we so often discard this notion as apathy, and I think it's often just despair. 
why engage in a system that doesn't seem to recognize you to recognize your value. But what I urge is to recognize that it's part of a larger ecosystem, protesting in the streets to demand what we need, protesting at the ballot box to deliver the people to give it to us and protesting in the halls of power to hold them accountable. And that that cycle becomes a virtuous one when we recognize that the challenges we face never disappear. And so it's a constant process moving towards change as opposed to this moment of realization where everything is fine and we can all take a nap. That's not how America works. That's not how you know, life works. Uh, but the other piece, in, and this is what I learned at the LBJ school, we have to go all the way down the ballot. Most of the, the things that will change and affect our lives happen at the level where Pete operated, happen where I operated. It's city and county and school board, it's state legislatures. Yes, we need a president who is a good leader. Yes, we need a Congress that is functional, but we also need state and local leaders who see our challenges and our struggles and daily uh, relief and are willing to do the work to help us. And so I urge everyone to not only believe in the perfection of our union, but also believe in the totality of our work. And that is we have to work from the bottom to the top and we have to work every day to make this country what we believe it can be. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Mayor Pete, for giving us some inspirational thoughts, some challenges and some hope. I really appreciate you joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us, Dean. It's an honor. Thanks for the chance to be with you. Now I'd like to uh, introduce everyone to Linda Johnson Robb, uh, the First Lady of Virginia, who is going to give us her thoughts about the LBJ School and our 50th anniversary. So let's welcome Linda Johnson Robb. Thank you. What an extraordinary celebration of the LBJ School's 50th anniversary this has been. I only wish my father and mother were here to witness what they created and how they both continue to contribute to a brighter future. Listening to Admiral McRaven, a heroic four-star admiral who also happens to be a professor at the LBJ School, I am reminded what remarkable talent resides in our halls and the eminent world leaders who have passed through its doors over the past 50 years, all determined to inspire new generations of young people toward public service. Admiral McRaven's outstanding service to our country is matched by his unwavering faith in the potential of our students and new generations of leaders across the globe to make this world a better place. There is something else that my father would have recognized as a signature LBJ legacy, our determination to train young leaders to work together to cross the often rigid divides of disciplines and backgrounds, and yes, politics. My father understood the value of working with people he disagreed with in order to get things done. It's easy to forget that during these divisive times. So let me remind you of just some of the laws he signed that had bipartisan support. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act to help vulnerable children with federal funding of local schools. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the 1965 Immigration Act, which ended the 1920s era quotas on immigration leading to the diverse nation that we have today, the landmark 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. In fact, we often forget that civil rights would never have passed if we hadn't had a lot of Republican support. And of course, there is Medicare. In fact, in 1965, after Medicare passed on a bipartisan vote, my father traveled to Missouri to give the first Medicare cards to President and Mrs. Truman. He knew they too had worked hard to make this happen. They were among those who had started that ball rolling. The result, all senior citizens in this country enjoy more security of health care. Even and especially in these polarized times, we're intent on fostering new generations of leaders who can appeal to people's better natures, who are willing to work together on difficult issues, who can inspire and educate all of us. We at the LBJ School understand that public service isn't an easy or a safe calling. As William Shakespeare once wrote, the evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. Yes, we remember the bad 
And too often we forget to herald the good people and their good deeds. As we mark this 50th anniversary of the LBJ School, my father's living legacy, let us send a message to all those young people fighting for change. We see you, we value you, and in most importantly, we believe in you. And as my good friend, former Texas Lieutenant Governor, assures us, if my father could see the young people studying at this school, he'd take full possession of their ambition to do good. He would say, and I'm quoting Ben, they're my young men and women, and that's why we're going to save this country. Thank you for being part of the LBJ School's 50th anniversary. And thank you, Dean Evans, for your incredible leadership and dedication to make our dreams come true. Good night, God bless, and now I will pass the baton over to Dean Evans for closing remarks. Thank you for joining us. Throughout the 50th year celebration of our school, we have recommitted to LBJ's quest to honor and support public service and prepare those who will take up the call. The school is not defined by its stone and mortar presence on the grounds of the University of Texas at Austin. It is a living presence, a force, a call to action, a roadmap for leadership and civic engagement. It is grounded on the power of democracy and the conviction that everyone has the right and the ability to shape our nation's destiny. The LBJ School is committed to playing its part in enriching civic discourse and developing America's public leaders. Our hope is that you will see these forums as a celebration of the dedication and goodness of the American people, as a reminder that we are a nation of diverse talent, that we are resilient, that we do not shy away from big problems, and that we all have a role in ensuring the endurance and prosperity of our country and the well-being of the world. And we hope you will take pride in those purpose-driven young people who are learning how to harness the power of America's talents for the public good. Now stay tuned. I speak tonight for the dignity of man and the destiny of democracy. When you walk into the LBJ Museum and Library, you see four floors of glass. Our mission is at once the oldest and the most basic of this country. And you see those red boxes that are full of LBJ's papers. To right wrong, to do justice, to serve man. This is the story of how one man, in many ways, literally, Remade America. My father had big, bold dreams of bringing everybody into the tent of opportunity. Johnson saw America as a place where anyone could succeed. My grandmother felt that Education would be Lyndon Johnson's passport out of poverty. He got a job teaching in a small South Texas town called Catula. My students were poor, and they often came to class without breakfast, hungry. They knew, even in their youth, the pain of prejudice. They never seemed to know why people disliked them. He saw through the eyes of those children what poverty looks like, what bigotry looks like, what, what hatred and injustice looks like. And it never left him. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade. The flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. In 1963, when LBJ became president, 
He was urged not to rock the boat. He was a new president. He had come to power after a tragic assassination. And Johnson says, what the hell is the presidency for if I can't use it to remake this country for the better? There was a kind of grandiosity to Lyndon Johnson. He never, so to speak, saw the top of the mountain. He wanted to keep reaching. Lyndon Johnson believed in the welfare and dignity, the decency and innate integrity of every individual. It was a belief backed by muscular action and an ambitious legislative agenda that rivaled that of FDR. Medicaid and Medicare. Head Start. Children trapped by circumstances need a way out. Head Start is that way. Aid to dependent children. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act. No law I have signed or will ever sign means more to the future of America. The National Endowment for the Arts. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Absolutely instrumental in the creation of NASA. Clean water, clean air acts, public broadcasting. The Immigration Act of 1965 literally changed the faces of America. Above all, the dream of equal rights for all Americans. The Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. It is wrong, deadly wrong, to deny any of your fellow Americans the right to vote in this country. He understood that the fundamental right to vote undergirded every citizen's ability to ask for what they need and to fight for what they deserve. The president was in a joint session of Congress introducing the voting rights bill. It was such a powerful, moving moment. It's all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. It's the only time I saw Martin Luther King cry. Tears just dripped down his cheek. LBJ signed over 200 pieces of legislation. Much of it shaping the nation we live in today. But an escalating Vietnam War with his mountain casualties began to engulf his presidency. On March 31st, 1968, in an address from the Oval Office, Lyndon Johnson shocked the nation. I shall not see, and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Johnson went home to his ranch in Stonewall, Texas, where he would begin making plans to build a school of public policy, a school designed to foster new generations of purpose-minded leaders who would continue his mission for social change. It was a race against time. When he went back to, to Texas, he was worn out. He really was not in good health. From that moment on, he knew he was a marked man. The LBJ school became his link to eternity. He wanted the LBJ school to not just be scholars, but to be practitioners. A school that would train people, young people, to come into government and want to be in public service. But LBJ's dream to inspire young leaders to think big and act bold a school that was to be his link to eternity nearly failed right out of the gate. We received very few applications. The Vietnam conflict had accelerated and he still received a great deal of blame. There was a fog hanging over the school during that period, all as a result of uh, the anti-Vietnam movement. We went to President Johnson's office and he just received the word that no young people wanted to enroll in his public policy school. I saw a man broken in spirit. I saw a man whose face was full of pain and agony. And I saw a man who was so discouraged and, and was humiliated. I came up with the idea that we would pay the way 100% 
with the students that would enroll in the LBJ school, they would be on a full scholarship. That was the determinant factor for me, and I think it was quite candidly for a lot of other students. The uh, school opened. Linda Johnson was alive to see uh, the first uh, class of the LBJ school. They didn't realize it then, but that first class of students was on the forefront of a coming sea change and how the world would remember LBJ's presidency. The epiphany for me was my first year at the school, how federal policy could be better utilized and leveraged to help underprivileged kids. The great importance of Lyndon Johnson's legacy is that he believed in the use of government to advance the national well-being. I was a child uh, of Appalachia in a coal mining town in eastern Ohio. It's a safe bet I wouldn't be sitting here today if it hadn't been for the war on poverty. <laughs> Those programs gave us hope and opportunity. For 50 years, as we came to understand the enduring impact of the 36th president's domestic legacy, the LBJ school rose to prominence. The school's rocky start strengthened the resolve of its faculty, who had served in government at the highest levels, often during tumultuous times. After the Berlin Wall came down, we had 22 students in Budapest in Hungary, and we had about 10 or 12 students in Poland. I think every state and almost every country in the world has had some LBJ student to have a significant role in the history of what's happened since the school was founded. Our faculty here and our students here and our alumni here, they are doing things. They are in the middle of the most contentious problems. They're trying to solve them. Our students are taught to think big and to dream big. Those dreams are based in data and facts and reason. The intersection between wildlife conservation and security issues. Community engagement and sustainable development. The crossroads of national defense and economic development. The health system and policy response to gender-based violence. They come to the LBJ school because they give a damn. If they fail, they get back up and try again. That's the DNA of the school. <laughs> From early on, the LBJ school's hands-on culture was shaped by renowned public leaders, presidents, vice presidents, Supreme Court justices, governors, members of Congress, foreign leaders, and diplomats. Now, the number of eminent leaders from around the world that have walked through these doors is just incredible. Women have played a huge role in it since day one. Lady Bird Johnson was a huge driving force. She believed that we all had an obligation to give back uh, for being so lucky to live in this country. We are a people in a quandary about the present. We are a people in search of our future. Barbara Jordan came from Congress and uh, she had just shaken the world with her speech in 1976. She really challenged the American people to come together as a society. We are attempting to fulfill our national purpose to create and sustain a society in which all of us are equal. Those words resonate more than ever today. They capture our hopes and dreams, even in a time of crisis. They capture the essence of Lyndon Johnson and what it means to be part of the LBJ School of Public Affairs. Having the chance to attend a school that bore not only his name, but had this deep commitment to his legacy was transformative. When you're faced with big challenges, you have to keep your eyes on innovative solutions. Today, more than any other time, we need students who have purpose, who have passion, and who we can train to take their purpose and passion and move it in a way that makes a difference. When you say LBJ, I think of a fighter. I think of somebody that spent his whole career fighting for a better society. 
The wall behind me embodies that great society that LBJ himself once envisioned. It also shows the power that one person can do in public policy. You tell people that you are an alum of the LBJ school, that says something. It says that you have a commitment to civil rights and to social justice, that you believe that policy has to follow idea, and that action requires that you push forward even in the face of challenge. We have an obligation to continue his legacy. If the president were alive today and could see the students of the LBJ school walk up those steps and cast their eyes upon those bill captions of the legislation he wrote, he would say they're my young men and they're my young women and that's why we're gonna save this country.